Good day. My name is Kelly Cox. I'm your moderator for the Regional Community Workshop for Florida. We have elected Florida as a state of its own. Of course, you are. You know that. But just to make sure we concentrate on the region, because there's so many myeloma patients in the region, and there's a lot of myeloma doctors. And I'm pleased, as I'll talk in a minute, about the doctors that are here with us today. I have been with the foundation for 20 years, and I am senior director of regional community workshops and director of support groups. I have visited your fine state of Florida to visit support groups in Miami for, uh, and Orlando. Most of my time is spent here on the West Coast where it's supposed to be a, a foggy day at 59 degrees. I read the papers today. You guys have a balmy day at 75. So I think I'm going to get on a plane and come to Florida. But I don't know if my wife would like that, so I might just have to stay here. Well, today you're going to see a workshop, and I'd like you to do me a favor. Get a notepad, a number two pencil or a pen, whatever you use, and put it by your side. But I don't want you to sweat if you miss a slide, because after today's meeting, if, you'll see a link to getting to your uh, re-recording or your recorded seminar. So rest assured, you miss something, you'll get it here. Now, this is a very informal, formal talk. We have some of the greatest doctors in the world coming to you today, and they're going to speak to you about several aspects of myeloma. There'll be a quick question and answers uh, uh, window after, your, after the live talk, and I want you to show you right now, <clears throat> excuse me, the welcome to Q&A uh, paper here where it says anonymously. You can send it with your name or anonymously, we don't care but just say we have, you have that option. You'll fill out your information in the question box and it'll be real simple for us to read. What's the next slide here, please? Now, while they're getting the next slide together, this is my 114th regional community workshop. You could say I invented it in the dark ages and that would go with my age, of course, which is in the dark ages. Now I see some pictures of some other people that are working today. We got Dr. Mikhail, Dr. Freeman, and Kathy Colson, who is in our IMF Nurse Leadership Board. Kathy, you've been doing this for a few years, if I'm not mistaken. Right. And you'll see, oh, well, good. There, you guys are unmuted. Great. Uh, you'll see a lot today. You're going to see what's new, what's coming, what's around, what's going on currently with your disease. So rest assured, you're going to get some great answers. Now, I always have to thank our sponsors. Without them, we wouldn't be able to do this. So it's Amgen, Bristol Myers Squibb, GSK, Janssen, Cario Farm, Uncle Peptides, Takeda Oncology. These groups are incredibly good for us in the senses that we bring educational material to you, period. We are the number one source for educational material. We have been for 30 years, almost 31 now. So I always relate it to the fact that if you watch golf, and I'm sure a lot of you Floridians do, you go to the Masters in April, they play a couple rounds of golf, maybe three or so, and you get the green jacket when you win. This green jacket is so important to the players that many players work their whole life to get it. We wear the number one green jacket. We've been doing it for a while. So get your pencils and your pens out and your, get a legal pad, not a, not a normal pad, and start listening and start writing, and we'll get a feedback from you after the program. You guys know who I am. Let's go to Myeloma 101. We'll be uh, Dr. Joe McHale, and he will be going into some of the basics of uh, myeloma as it is. Then he'll go into frontline therapy, um, and then we'll do a quick question and answering. At 10.55, we do a stretch break and a meditation break. Real simple, quick 10 minutes but very helpful to calm you down, get you relaxed and stretching gently and so forth and so on. Then Dr. Freeman from Moffitt Cancer Center will talk about relapse therapy and clinical trials, yet another very important topic, especially for you people out there that have lived 10, 15 years now. Then Kathy Colson, how to manage myeloma symptoms and side effects. You are going to know exactly what she's talking about. You are going to learn about what she's talking about, and you're going to have a feeling of relief. Then we have a question and answer panel, and then we say goodbye. So not too much time. Let's go into multiple myeloma 101 and frontline therapy with Dr. Joe McHale. Joe, you mind taking it away from here? 
Happy, happy to do so, Kelly. Uh, you are absolutely the host with the most, brother. I, you got the <laughs> DJ voice. You got the legal pad. Uh, it's no wonder you've been doing this over a hundred times. I'm always humbled to join you on the stage, brother. And, oh, uh, it's my pleasure to do this today. Welcome to our uh, friends in in the Tampa area and throughout Florida. Uh, we're just absolutely delighted to have you. We've we've even added one of our newest, uh, one of your newest recruits who you're going to meet later, Dr. Kira Freeman. It's been uh, one of the joys of my life to mentor individuals, and I've had the chance to mentor Kira a little bit. Uh, she's kind of pretty much been all over the world, but now has finally arrived in Florida between uh, Ireland and uh, Arizona and uh, London and Vancouver and now Florida. Uh, I bet you the Floridians think that she's been on a slow ascent to better and better places. And she's now uh, made it to her new home with her beautiful family. And Kira, we're so thankful that you're here. I look forward to hearing you later. And Kathy is just fantastic. Uh, I, I learn from Kathy every time she presents. So I'm really glad that I have the opportunity to share it with uh, these folks. I was actually chatting with a patient this week who comes to a lot of our educational activities who said something to me that I thought was pertinent to start our discussion this morning. And what he said was, you know, Dr. Joe, even though I've heard multiple myeloma 101 several times, he's had myeloma for over 10 years, he said, every time I hear it, I learn something new. And so my objective over this next uh, 30, 35 minutes or so is to really get us thinking about the basics of myeloma, which could be a refresher for some, brand new for others. But as I always say, I like to have high hanging fruit and low hanging fruit. So if you're an expert in myeloma, literally, uh, hopefully there's something for you. If you're a patient newly diagnosed, we'll definitely have things for you. If you're a patient that has had myeloma for a short period of time, long period of time, uh, we want to provide help to you in any way we can. And as Kelly said, this is recorded, and we really look forward for uh, the Q&A period. So I'm just going to review um, a few uh, basics of blood and cancer just to get us on the same page, because you know people hear the word myeloma, they think it's a skin cancer, it can be a bit confusing. We'll talk about myeloma and its key features, and then I'll spend uh, the, the, the second half uh, of our time talking about how we approach myeloma and this whole concept of stem cell transplant. So now, Dr. Freeman and I are hematologists, so we have this sort of unusual love of blood, right? We're not uh, uh, vampires or anything creepy like that, but we, we've always been fascinated by blood. And sometimes I try and think of it in a simple way. The blood is an organ. I know sometimes you think of an organ, you think of the heart or the kidneys like the solid, but we're the organ that is everywhere, right? And, and so we uh, are all over the body as blood. And the blood is made up of the liquidy stuff and the solid stuff. The liquidy stuff is the plasma, and the solidy stuff are the cells, of which I think uh, the analogy I try to remember, there are three kinds of cells, a uh, white, red, and rosé, for those who are, are wine drinkers, not exactly rosé, they're platelets, but we have red cells, white cells, and platelets. Red cells, in their essence, are just little trucks that carry oxygen. I know I'm offending all the hematologists on the planet right now, but essentially that's all they do. They come to the lungs, pick up oxygen, deliver them to the tissues and come back for more. White cells, on the other hand, are kind of like the military. In fact, there are five types of white cells, like we have five major branches of the military, I guess. Uh, and so these are the cells that protect you. And then little cells, these rosé or platelet cells, are just like ambulances because they get there first. If you have a cut, they get there and they plug up the hole until your body can make a really strong clot uh, to, to stop uh, the bleeding. And all of these three cells are made in the factory of your blood, which is the bone marrow. And obviously we're gonna be talking a lot about the bone marrow today. This is why I've given you this backdrop. You know, if you see, I don't know, cars that have been produced at a car factory, you can assess the factory by seeing the cars, but the best way to assess the factory is to go into the factory. And so when we go into the factory, we're gonna find new things. Now, what is cancer by contrast? Cancer is really just identical uncontrolled growth. It's easier to conceptually think of a, a lump of lung cancer or breast cancer or colon cancer, but, but cancer is really just uncontrolled growth. And so this can happen with liquid, if you will, tumors as well. And so your body has this delicate balance of making sure your cells grow enough so that you get what you need. But when they start to grow out of control, we run into trouble. 
And so this is literally what's happening in, in myeloma, as we're going to show you, is that the very cells that are in your, in your bone marrow being made and sometimes slip out and make it into your peripheral blood, these cells are the ones that are meant to protect you, but now they become cancerous and they can hurt you. That's kind of like the, what I call the double whammy. The very ones that are meant to protect you are actually now starting to hurt you. So myeloma in brief then is a cancer of the plasma cells. Now, um, uh, uh, as some of you know, I've been recently engaged. I'm getting married in a couple of months. Um, I love my fiance, Emily. I don't have a picture of her plasma cells um, uh, that I look at, but as a myeloma doctor, I'm, I'm kind of tempted at some point to find a way to identify her plasma cells. Plasma cells are really important cells, and we don't often think of them as critical cells in the body, but plasma cells have gotten more press over the pandemic than ever before. Why? Because plasma cells make your antibodies, right? We've been talking about all these antibodies. You go get a COVID shot. I hope you've all gotten your COVID shot. When you get your COVID shot, you produce antibodies or a kind of protein that fights against COVID in case you get it. These are the cells that are pertinent in myeloma because unfortunately, instead of those cells responding to a vaccine and making good antibody, now they go bad. And they make bad, if you will, antibodies, what we call monoclonal antibodies. Instead of, instead of polyclonal of different shapes and sizes, mono, remember we said cancer is identical, uncontrolled growth. Now you have identical, uncontrolled growth of plasma cells that make this, sometimes we call it an M protein or monoclonal protein that can now paradoxically, instead of fight off infection for you, actually hurt you, attack your kidneys and attack your bones. So about 35,000 patients will be diagnosed with myeloma this year. Tragically, we'll still see about 12,000 deaths. The survival is dramatically improving, which is great, but there are still some aspects of myeloma that are particularly tough to treat, what we call high-risk myeloma. Another very important feature is myeloma is twice as common in the African-American population than it is in the white population. And sadly, uh, outcomes have been quite inferior within the African-American population. I'm going to come to this a little bit later because the IMF is leading a great effort we call the Empower Initiative, where we're trying to empower individuals and communities to change the course of multiple myeloma because the current course of myeloma is not appropriate. The fact that uh, so many African-American patients uh, die sooner with myeloma, anyone who dies of myeloma dies sooner than they should, of course, uh, but, but the outcomes in African-American patients are particularly worrisome. And me, myself with African origin, this is a particularly sensitive and personal topic for me. And, and so we know we have a lot of work to do in this area. And I got to come back to that a little bit later. So what have you learned? Myeloma is a cancer of the plasma cells. Instead of just generally call them the antibodies, we call them immunoglobulins. You know, doctors, we love to use words that patients don't understand. Um, so IG for short, and there are different types of immunoglobulins. Uh, and we know that this is a disease that generally is diagnosed later in life. 65 to 74 is the, the general range. But we have, I just saw a patient last week in my clinic who I did his bone marrow transplant when he was 25. So we have a huge spectrum within this uh, area. And so when we measure myeloma, we can measure it in the bone marrow by looking at those plasma cells, but I know most of you are happy that your doctor's not doing the bone marrow test every month. We can also measure it by the proteins or the antibodies that get released into the blood. And sometimes it's the whole protein, that, that Y-shaped thing that you see there, what we call the heavy and the light chains together, but sometimes those little bits on the side, what we call the light chains can also be measured. Some people even have only light chain disease. So there are different ways to measure this. Sometimes, uh, not to be uh, uh, too gross, but sometimes I say myeloma is like a crime scene, right? You, there isn't one piece of information that tells you the whole story. For most patients, we need the bone marrow test and the x-rays and the blood tests of different types to fully put it all together. So on the right here in red, we have myeloma. We define it as when you have more than 10% uh, plasma cells in your bone marrow, and you do indeed have something that's damaging you or about to damage you, and I'm going to go to that in a minute. Now, for time's sake, I'm not going to go into this a lot of detail, but just to remind us, it appears that everybody who has myeloma actually has had a pre-myeloma condition before, a, a slower growing feature that eventually became myeloma. This, 
This thing called MGUS or monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance. I know that's a mouthful. It just means you got this little schmutz of protein, but it's not hurting you. It's actually really common. In fact, 5% of the population have it. In fact, in a few weeks, uh, we're going to hear a lot more about the big project that the IMF has been working on, the iStop project in Iceland, where we're going to learn about the true incidence of MGUS. But when myeloma becomes active, it typically causes what we call CRAB. The calcium goes up or the kidney or renal uh, um, is damaged, the renal complications of it. We have anemia or a low red blood cell count, or we have bone disease. Some people have one of these four, some people have all of these four, or everything in between. Recently, we added a few more criteria because we realized why wait until someone's kidney is damaged to really call them myeloma. So if the light chains are really high in the, in the blood, or if the bone marrow is really filling up with these cancer cells, we know that it's gonna be very soon that unfortunately someone is gonna be damaged. Or if we see some changes on a certain kind of X-ray and the MRI, we see what we call focal lesions in the bone marrow. All of these things tell us that someone has multiple myeloma. Sometimes we summarize these all together with the phrase slim crab. That was my contribution to the myeloma community. I kind of dropped the mic and walked off the stage, uh, but that, that, was, that was it. That, that just helps us remember these seven features of active multiple myeloma. And I'm not going to get into them in a lot of detail, but those may just look like doctor talk. But when people have anemia, they can be tired. When people have low blood counts, they can get an infection. When the kidney is damaged, initially it can make people very weak. Very worrisome, of course, is when the bone is damaged. It can cause a lot of pain and people can generally feel unwell. In fact, the three most common symptoms that people will have when they present, signs and symptoms they have when they present with myeloma is that they'll be fatigued, they'll have some kind of bone pain, not always in the back, but typically that's the most common place, or if they have a low red blood cell count. And so this has been part of our work to make sure people get investigated when these things are there. Now, I already made a brief comment early, earlier about African-Americans and myeloma, but this is a particularly important call to action for us because even though it often takes every myeloma patient some time to make the diagnosis between they first have the symptom and diagnosed, do you know that the average myeloma patient sees a family doctor three times before they get diagnosed with myeloma based on their signs and symptoms? That time is even longer within the African-American community. African-Americans are diagnosed younger, and as we mentioned, it's twice as common. As we're going to be hearing from myself and from Kira in a moment, three of the most important treatments that we have in myeloma that have improved survival are what we call the three Ts, uh, transplants, triplets, and trials. And sadly, African-Americans are less likely to have access to these three things, and we're working very hard to overcome that. I'd mentioned earlier that we've seen more survival improvement in myeloma than almost any other cancer. But we've not seen that same improvement in African-Americans. However, the hope, and this last point is the hope here, is that we know in certain systems, like in the VA system, where at least theoretically, everyone is given access to the same treatment, we have found that African-Americans and white patients can have equal outcomes. If anything, we've seen better outcomes in black patients. So as we go through this, it's important that you have the opportunity to learn a little bit about your own disease, right? One of the things that this regional community workshop is designed to do is to not just let us want, 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 like Charlie Brown's teacher, give you a lecture, but to engage you in your own disease, whether you have myeloma or someone you, has my, has, someone you know has myeloma and you're serving as their caregiver. One of the things I think is really important is to learn these blood tests. I didn't go through all of them, but basically we have that, that red, white, and rosé cell uh, measurement. We have what we call the chemistry within the blood and then the measures of the myeloma proteins. And these become really important in our discussion today. Now, when we come to treat patients, um, as we're gonna see, it's not just a cookbook. Oh, you have this kind of myeloma, therefore Dr. Freeman is gonna order A, B, and C for you. It, it's not that simple. We look at a lot of different things. We look at the tests. Sometimes I say to patients, it's called multiple myeloma for a reason, because in fact, there's multiple versions of myeloma and some people will get some kind of treatment and some will get another kind of treatment. It matters what your values are, what your goals are, what your preferences are, um, and what your, the rest of your health is like as we put that together. 
So that's why often I show a slide like this that reminds us that at the middle is the patient's preference, but we look at lots of different things that might influence exactly the way we're gonna treat you and what's offered to you as we show you a lot of these options today. Now, again, not to go through this, this looks like a laundry list, but to give you a flavor of the multiple different drugs that we have available to us, really we often highlight the three major classes that we're working with, what are called immunomodulatory drugs, what are called proteasome inhibitors, and what are called monoclonal antibodies. And we'll be talking about a lot of the drugs in these classes as we go uh, forward. Now, one of the things I do really want to emphasize is that um, you're blessed in so many areas in, in Florida uh, uh, because you have so many great experts in myeloma, uh, even at, uh, uh, at Moffitt where Dr. Freeman works. I mean, there are four or five people who have really dedicated most of their life to myeloma. Some do work within transplant. I mean, they have just a disturbingly nice and smart group of people. Uh, that's why you fit in so nicely there, Kira. And, and, and uh, that being said, the majority of myeloma patients in the country are cared for by a general oncologist and they're great, but they may require some help as they take care of 20, 30, 40 different kinds of tumors. Myeloma has become very uh, specialized. And so uh, there are ways of doing this and we can give you more information about that later. All right, so hopefully I've given you at least a bit of an overview of the basics of myeloma. And now let's talk about how we treat myeloma. Um, although I always say, I don't treat myeloma, I treat people. And so it's very important for us to always retain the human dimension as we go forward. But in the next, in the last 15 minutes, let's talk a little bit about how we treat myeloma. I always start with principles before I give specifics. So we know, first of all, that what we do early on makes a really big difference later. Sometimes that might not sound conceptually right. People say, oh, it doesn't matter what you get first or second, you know, it kind of matters what happens later on. Actually, because of the biology of this disease, if we can get good control of it early on, we've learned that's what can give patients the longest survival. So what we do in our first line of therapy becomes really important, which is why principle number two is we don't save the best for last. Some of you have heard me say, save the best for last is great for a Hallmark movie as you get ready to watch your Hallmark movies over the holidays to come. Um, it's really cute, but actually that's not what we do in myeloma. We are, we're gonna see, and we're gonna hear a little bit from, from Dr. Freeman, of course, that we are bringing these great new therapies that we've developed, we're bringing them earlier and earlier in the disease course so they can have a longer lasting, a longer lasting effect. Number three, it's really important that we combine drugs together. It's not a perfect example, but you know, in um, myeloma, uh, um, we use combinations and we've learned a little bit from, for example, our infectious diseases colleagues, where how did we mostly overcome HIV? It wasn't finding one great drug. It was actually combining drugs together. And so we're going to hear a lot about combinations today. Number four, we seek what I call the two D's of response, depth and duration. So it's one thing to see the myeloma shrink, which could be measured typically in the blood tests of your M protein or M spike or your light chain measurement, but we don't want to just see it shrink. We want to see it stay down. And so a lot of our strategies are designed in that twofold way to get it down and keep it down. The three classes that I've mentioned, the proteasome inhibitors, the immunomodulatory drugs, the monoclonal antibodies, we have uh, two to three great drugs in each of these classes. And then we have to decide early on whether or not someone is going to have a stem cell transplant. Stem cell transplant in brief is, an op is really giving people one big whopping dose of chemo. That's really all it is. Uh, but to do that, we have to collect from you some of your bone marrow because that chemo wipes out a good part of your marrow so that we can give you your cells back and grow anew. And it's kind of like saying, I want to get rid of the weeds in my lawn. I'm going to just burn the lawn. Okay, that's good, but I better have seeds in the garage to grow a new one. And so we collect seeds from you, burn the lawn as it were, and give you your seeds back. And so when we typically... Uh, see a patient initially, we make a distinction, are you transplant eligible or ineligible? The ASCT stands for autologous stem cell transplant, where autologous means your own stem cells. And we make that determination, not just by age, but that's part of it by a whole series of your own medical conditions. And then whether or not someone is transplant, what we call eligible or not, 
that will determine how we treat them. And again, I didn't want to get into too much detail of just what, what exact drugs. I'll show you a few slides now to guide us through. But if people are not going to transplant, we're typically giving them one of two major options, what we call VRD or DRD. And if patients are transplant candidates, initially now we're still typically using VRD, but as I'll show you, we have other options in that area. So the way I'm going to cover transplant eligible disease is start by asking three questions and hopefully answer these three questions. I'll have three questions for transplant ineligible, and then we'll have a little bit of time for the Q&A. And I'll just remind you, as Kelly mentioned, that you can enter your questions in the Q&A, whether you wish to do so as um, a, a, anonymously or not. Uh, we're happy to answer questions, and Kathy and uh, Kira will join me for the Q&A session uh, in, in about 12 or 14 minutes from now. All right, so question number one is always a big question. Do we still have to do the transplant? Well, we had a study a number of years ago that now has had long-term follow-up where we compared giving that combination of RVD or Revlimid, Velcade and Dexamethasone, plus a transplant versus just RVD alone. And it was really trying to isolate the, to see if there is a benefit of giving a transplant. And we learned that the people who had a transplant stayed in remission about a year longer than those who did not have transplant. Interestingly, in the long-term follow-up, there was no difference in their overall survival. And we can talk a bit about that if there are questions, but the bottom line here is 80% of the people that didn't have a transplant actually ended up getting one at their first relapse. And so this is one of the first studies to point us in the direction to saying, wait a minute, transplant still seems to have a role. We have another big study that uh, is going to, um, or sorry, there's another study that didn't just use VRD, but used KRD. So sometimes we, we change the Velcade to a drug called Carfilzomib or Kyprolis, uh, and in particular in patients who may have high-risk disease or patients who may already have neuropathy because bortezomib could potentially cause neuropathy. And so we've had other studies that have used KRD of which this one was actually just published a few weeks ago, where they compared, now instead of saying, okay, well, in the first study, we gave VRD, and we also only gave um, um, a, a total uh, of eight cycles. Here, we're giving a whole year of KRD in the green bucket, and in the blue bucket, we're giving only eight months of it plus a transplant. And it looked like everybody, if you just look at the, the bars on the right, I know there's a lot of information here, but look at those two blue bars, 58 and 54. It didn't look like there was much a difference between them, but later on, and remember the higher the curve, the better, it means more people are staying in remission. It actually showed to us that those patients that had a transplant still stayed in remission longer than those that didn't have the transplant. So as it stands today, we still believe the transplant has a role. Now we're trying to even make VRD or KRD better by adding a fourth drug to it. Hey, if three works, can four be better? Now, obviously we have to be very sensitive to toxicity, but here we're giving four drugs. We're adding daratumumab to that VRD. And if you notice here, just look at purple. It's the only color I want you to look at that we want more and more purple. And in general, you see there's more purple with the four drug combination than the three. But interestingly, that purple keeps getting deeper as we treat patients more. There was the initial treatment, the transplant, we even give a bit more of that initial treatment. And then we put people on what's called maintenance therapy, where we keep them on treatment for longer. And that purple bar just got bigger each time, which tells us that it is actually valuable uh, to continue to have a transplant. So lastly, the master trial, which we're gonna hear about in a couple of weeks at our upcoming meeting, did a same concept of four drugs versus, uh, of giving four drugs of daratumumab plus KRD. But in this case, instead of just giving a set number of cycles, they keep giving it until we reach what's called MRD or minimal residual disease negativity, which means that we can't measure the disease anymore. Uh, and we're really looking forward to hearing more about the study in a few weeks. So as we look at this, it, I mean, the percentages that I've highlighted in the box where people have got at least a 90% reduction in their tumor. These percentages are remarkable. We've never seen numbers like this before, where we're seeing almost all patients going into that deep response. 
So in answer to these questions, is transplant still necessary? Well, right now it still looks like it has a role to play. What is the best triplet combination? Well, it looks like we've got great evidence for both VRD and KRD. I would still say that VRD is still more commonly used before transplant, but KRD is a very valid option, especially when people may not want to use the V, as I mentioned, usually either because of certain features of high-risk disease or if someone has neuropathy. And then lastly, are we going to quadruplets where we add either daratumab or the newest monoclonal antibody, something called isatuximab, um, to the combinations? And I think we're going to be seeing this very, very soon. There is a lot of interest in doing that. Then lastly, let's talk about patients who are not going to transplant. Now, when we say ineligible, it's not like, oh, thanks for coming out. You know, you, you just got excluded. You got voted off the island. No, it, it means that we know that transplant can be a tough process. And we don't want the treatment to be worse than the disease. And we know that it's not just based on age, as I mentioned, but lots of factors where we may say, we don't think transplant's a good idea. Now, what I'm going to show you in a moment, it's really quite encouraging we are seeing the best outcomes we have ever seen in patients not going to transplant with the treatments that we're giving right now. And so the three questions are, should we be using triplets instead of doublets? And I'll give you a hint, the answer is yes. Um, how long should patients be treated? And, and what can make these combinations more tolerable? Well, the, one of the largest studies and most important studies, uh, of course, done by my boss, so I want to make sure I mention it, Dr. Dury, who is the uh, chair of the board of the IMF and my boss, um, is, uh, led this study where we compared that VRD combination that, that typically we've used in transplant eligible patients to just giving RD. And the bottom line was giving VRD gave people a longer period in remission of about a year, but also extended their lives, overall survival, by a year. And so it really uh, uh, highlighted to us that this was feasible and important to do. And so VRD became the standard of care, even if patients were or were not going to a stem cell transplant. Challenge with VRD in this population in particular is that with time, we can see a lot of neuropathy. And so we typically have to stop the V and neuropathy is that numbness, tingling, and even pain that people can have in their fingers or their feet when they have this drug. There was a trial that tried to compare VRD to KRD, and there's a lot of data around this trial that I'm not going to bore us with. But the bottom line is there really wasn't a big difference. It wasn't that one was particularly better than the other. So sometimes we use one, sometimes we use others based on uh, patients and what risk factors they or may not have. But what is probably the biggest news that was just released as an update a few months ago was a similar study. Instead of adding Velcade to the Revlimid and Dexamethasone, we added Daratumumab to the Revlimid and Dexamethasone. It was called the Maya study. And we saw rates that we've never seen before. So progression-free survival just means how long did someone stay in remission before their disease came back? And at five years, over half of patients were still in remission if they got this combination. One of the differences in this combination is we give both the daratumab and the Revlimid continuously. Whereas in that VRD studies I showed you, we typically stop the Velcade at six or maybe 12 months. And so this also translated into what we call an overall survival advantage, meaning over two thirds of patients were still alive after five years. And that's with one line of therapy. So it's really remarkable um, the advances we've seen in multiple myeloma. So yes, I think we have proven that three is better than two. I think we have shown that when patients get treated for longer, they can do better. However, I hope that we're going to develop what I call stopping rules as we go. And then lastly, and particularly importantly, and I'm going to end uh, in a few minutes on this note because it's just so important. We don't look at patients and say, you know, this clinical trial showed that the longer you take the drug, the better you do. So you're going to take it and you're going to like it and you're going to ask for more. Like, we never do that. We have to develop an open, honest communication between the healthcare team and the patient. We want you to guide us. It's not, it's not old school doctor where we just tell you, you know, here, dear, take this pill. We, we don't do that. It's so important that you are engaged in that conversation. 
you know, it's one thing for me to say to a patient, like, I'm going to give you some treatment and you might get a little bit sick for a few weeks even, but if you're going to be on this treatment for months and years, it is really important that we do have an open, honest communication because even with a, a relatively easy drug to take like Revlimid, a third of patients end up coming off of it because they have some kind of problem. And so we want to improve the quality of life as much as possible. Uh, oh, sorry. Um, and so one of the things we've learned, and I joke a little bit about is, I've joked with the nurse practitioner I work with that um, I want to change the name of my clinic. Instead of the myeloma clinic, it's going to be the dexamethasone reduction service. And, and Kathy is going to talk to us a little bit later about dexamethasone because we love it and hate it because it really helps almost every combination we give, but with time it hurts. So I think of it like the booster rockets on the shuttle, really good for the first few cycles, but then we have to start tilting it down because it's going to cause more grief. So when we conclude for transplant ineligible patients, it's amazing how similar our treatments are, whether people are going to transplant or not. Transplant is still the standard of care, but I'm really careful in who I select to go to transplant once people are over the age of 65, just because we know transplant can be tougher on the system. We've seen when we give continuous therapy that people can do better, but we have to balance that efficacy and that toxicity together. That's where that conversation becomes important. Are you having diarrhea? Are you having fatigue? Are you having routine infections? Are you having muscle cramping at night? All of these things that we can see when people are on longer term drugs. Typically we choose two out of the three major classes and eventually we may be choosing all three together. I typically use DRD in most patients, but I will uh, potentially use VRD in patients that have um, higher risk disease. Um, and I think in the future, just like we're seeing for transplant eligible patients, we're likely going to be using quadruplets. So for the visual learners in the crowd, I think of these colored uh, pillars that we have, proteasome inhibitors, immunomodulatory drugs, monoclonal antibodies, and alkylators. That's where we get the drug malphalan that we use for transplant. Those have been the base of myeloma for several years. And in a few minutes, you're going to hear from Dr. Freeman sharing these new pillars that are making their way into myeloma, using drugs like Selenexor and Belantamab, CAR T-cell therapy, and then maybe even these bispecific engagers before we go. Another way of looking at it is that we just keep increasing the number of options that we have for patients. And looking to the future, we're going to even have more options uh, than ever. Unfortunately, we have seen one drug that was removed from the market in malflin flufenamide, but we have many, many new drugs that are coming and are being developed. I've been involved in myeloma for over 20 years, kind of like Kelly, and um, I have not known a more exciting time for drug development in myeloma than the time that we're in right now. I just want to note that we have a beautiful presence around the planet and it's such a privilege to be the chief medical officer of the IMF. And I really look forward uh, to the questions that you have and the opportunity to discuss this a little bit further. So Kelly, believe it or not, we're right on schedule, brother. Oh my God, like next seven time. seconds. But, but, but I'm on to the second, uh, it's now uh, 1040. And uh, it looks like we're already getting some Q and A strolling in. We um, are. Kelly. Um, are there any situations that would cause you to re recommend a tandem transplant? So here's a great question. So just to, for clarity, a tandem transplant means where we do one transplant right after the other. And to summarize, there has been some data for this that seems to support the use of it. But most of us in the United States in particular do not do that because we have learned that if we give a good regimen before and maybe even a little bit after a single transplant, that second transplant may not be necessary. The people already have that depth of response. Not to mention that doing a second transplant can be tough. I sort of feel like my patient's been underwater. They just got their head above water. They're starting to breathe and we put them back down. So very, very select case, cases might we think of this. If someone, there's rare forms of myeloma that don't really respond very well to all these new drugs, but seem to respond well to melphalan. Some cases we may consider that, but if I do, you know, a hundred transplants in a year, I, I may consider one of them for a tandem. It's, it's really that unusual. I see. Uh, why do some patients have no success with stem cell transplant? 
So um, uh, maybe, maybe Dr. Freeman might want to answer that because she's a transplanter as well. I'm happy to chime in too, but but I, I yeah, don't I want think... this to be just the Joe show. So so I don't know, Kira, what do you think about why sometimes it's think... <clears throat> I think it's really tricky. I don't think we have a really good answer for that question. So, you know, part of, as Dr. McHale was saying, part of what makes the transplant work so well, in my mind, isn't necessarily just the chemo on the myeloma cells, but it's 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 the reset of your immune system. So it's it's growing a new lawn and a new lawn that's less permissive to weeds growing. So the weeds being the myeloma cells coming back. And if you can reset that immune system, and, and we, there's some really cool science to show this, that if, if you can, after a transplant, get your bone marrow, the environment, all the other cells in your bone marrow looking more like normal, the closer you get to that, the more likely you are to maintain a really nice, deep response and, and have that really nice, prolonged duration after your transplant. Now, I don't think we really understand well why some patients just don't respond to transplant. Either they have really cockroach myeloma cells that have this mechanism for either evading the death signal. Um, and sometimes we can see that with some genetic testing, like you might've heard some, some people talk about 17P deletion or other risk factors. So either they've got cockroach myeloma cells or there's probably something to do with the way their body metabolizes the melphalan. So remember that melphalan is a drug like anything else. And some patients, you know, will, will alter that drug in their body differently and deal with that drug in their body differently, you know, compared to other people. So whether maybe we, we don't get enough drug into them, it's hard to tell. And, and it's not a perfect science. So we're not, although we dose the melphalan according to body size, generally, you know, it, not all people are the same. Their body makeup is going to be different. How their liver works and deals with drugs is going to be different. Mm -hmm. So I, there's not a perfect answer to that question. And, and it's, as I said, it's not a perfect science. So I think, yes, if you take, you know, the big trial that, that Dr. Joe showed where they did in, in France and across Europe, where they had a huge number of patients, you know, overall, most patients who got the transplant in their first line of treatment did better. But, you know, was there a little subpopulation in there who didn't do as well? Of course there was. <clears throat> and it takes, you know, the, we, we always base our science on these big trials of people, but it's, it's harder to try and tease out like each individual person. How are they going to do compared to the, the mass at large? That's a That's really that. excellent wow. point. I, I totally excellent. agree. And I think, I think part of the issue is that um, everybody has to be looked at individually. And you want your doctor to be able to do that with you, your whole team to do that with you. Mm -hmm. Thankfully, people that truly, if you want to write, use the word fail transplant is less than 5%, where the disease comes back immediately thereafter, there's no deepening of, of the transplant. Sorry, Kelly, back to you. Uh, can fully vaccinated patients receive the monoclonal COVID treatment if they've contracted contract COVID? So I don't know if Kathy may want to answer that. You know, can yes. vaccinated patients receive... Um, you know, the, the monoclonal antibody treatments that we're giving very often early on in COVID. I'm not sure what your experience is in your center. I can share our experience as well, but but uh, it's always good to involve Kathy because she has such a vast experience in this. Sure. Kathy, you're muted. All right. You thank you. So the question is, can fully vaccinated patients receive monoclonal COVID treatments? Um, yes. I mean, in, in our institution, we have absolutely have been, you know, treating patients with monoclonal um, antibody therapies after they've received their COVID vaccinate, their vaccination. If that's what the question is yeah, saying. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, yes. absolutely. Yeah. We've, yeah, we've had treatment. the same experience, you know, I think, mm -hmm. I think, uh, while we have the COVID floor, Kelly, I can't help but say one more time, I really hope that all of our patients and their families on this call have had their vaccine um, and hopefully even their booster. We saw that just yesterday, obviously it was announced that um, every adult, so maybe even other family members and so on can now get the booster if you've had your vaccine mm -hmm. six months or more uh, ago. Um, and and uh, thankfully, you know, we've seen people do very, very well with it, including our myeloma patients. It's not perfect. But again, you know, my hospital is a hospital that has a lot of COVID over, over time. And we've been tracking this very closely. About 96% of patients admitted to our hospital with COVID are unvaccinated. 
So uh. one of the most important things people can do is to get vaccinated. And even our cancer patients, I've been struck recently at how many of our myeloma patients, when they had their booster, not that we always measure it, but in some patients, we've yeah. been measuring their antibody response to the booster, that that booster has really put them up at a high level to protect them. Uh, before we move on to the next thing, I want to tell some of the people out there listening. Joe, you brought up Learn Your Labs. You know, the myeloma.org foundation or .org has a, a link to that. I can't stress it enough how many times I've heard people go, I don't understand my labs. Incredibly important. And Joe, you talked about the last three slides that you showed with the breakdown. I remember 20 years ago, 21, we had thalidomide. And that was with prednisone, as it were. And to see, when you go back and listen, just take time on those last three slides because they're filled with information and it's very important. And something different that's happening now over the past or several years is y'all doctors, excuse me for using that, all the doctors are treating the person, treating the person. So if you're not getting that kind of experience with your doctor, call our info line at 800-452-2873. And the depth and durable response. Those are some items that you should write down about uh, uh, Dr. Joe's talk and so forth. We'll be, that will be done throughout the, the meeting. And with that being said, Dr. Freeman, are you ready to go? No, we do I a am. break first, right? Oh, you don't have to go yet, Dr. Freeman. We I'm are ready. Take I'm a, ready. I know I'm you ready. are, and I, I set it up wrong. I'm sorry. <laughs> Give us a few minutes. We're going to do a little meditation stretch break. That's good for you now. You can relax. Joe can get a cup of coffee. Kathy can drink a protein shake. And I'm going out and get an espresso. So let's okay. take a break. Welcome back. I hope that the stretch and the mindfulness helped you out a bit. It always helps me. Sometimes when I'm listening to the mindfulness, I fall asleep. And today I got really relaxed and had to go get another cup of coffee, which I hope you did too. Because the next, speak or next speaker is going to go into some heavy details here about your disease. And I, I, I also want to thank Dr. McHale for that great presentation at the beginning of this. So relapse ther therapy and clinical trials. Dr. Freeman at a MD at Moffitt Cancer Center in Tampa, Florida. A lot of people in Tampa have myeloma. So maybe you need to put her on your, your list of go sees. Then we'll have a quick question and answer. And we'll handle a couple of, question, couple of questions that happened from the previous segment. And then we're going to go into Kathy Colson. So I said it before, Dr. Freeman, are you ready? I am ready. Are, do, you, do you want to answer the last few questions at the end then? Those that, are the questions yeah, let's do that and get Joe you Stolten. going here. Okay. Yeah, please go. All right. Thank okay. you. So thank you very much for inviting me to give this fantastic talk to such a great, great group. I love the IMF, you know, fantastic amazing uh, organization and it's a, a great pleasure to um, take a few minutes to, to discuss with you um, what I hope to be an upbeat uh, topic which is about the very bright future that even if your disease or your care or your loved one's disease comes back that actually um, we have a lot more options that uh, things are working better than ever before and so the future is very bright um, so you can go on to the next slide so I'm hoping to cover um, a little bit about the different things that your doctor may discuss with you um, when your myeloma or your loved one's myeloma it comes back after the first line of therapy. Um, how to sort of understand the decision-making process that goes on. So as um, Dr. Joe said in his first talk, you know, it's not just a sort of cookie cutter approach to every patient. And there, there is a lot that goes into our decision-making process. And so that's important. Um, I'm gonna give you, share with you a flavor of, of the options, what tools we have in our toolbox that are you ready to use now. And then a little bit about what is coming down the road, what futures we have, what trials we have, what we've got coming to um, Moffitt. If, if you're in the Florida area, we, We'd love to see you and talk about what trials we have open. I'll give you a snapshot of what we have. Um, and, and then we can discuss if you've got any questions relating to that. So next slide, please. So, you know, we use these terms relapsed and refractory somewhat interchangeably. But um, I just thought it'd be helpful to have this understanding. 
So relapse is where, let's say you, you had an initial treatment and you were on a therapy break and sometimes that happens. Um, and maybe you're, you're being watched for a little while by your doctor. And then all of a sudden, you know, things change, your blood tests change and things come back. So that's, that's technically a relapse. So it comes back and that's something that we almost expect. That's why most patients, when I meet them for the first time, I say, you know, get ready to make friends with me because I'm going to see you, you know, basically until the end of your days, because I'll be watching you forever until we figure out that we've got we've got this cured and you know at, at least as of right now as of today we haven't quite got to that point with myeloma yet um, whereas refractory is a different term so that means that your disease is coming back despite ongoing therapy and that's that's a slightly different concept now because of the way we treat myeloma now a lot of the patients that we're seeing for the next treatment line are refractory insofar as the treatments that we're giving now more frequently are we continue them. So they're ongoing until either you run into issues with side effects or until your disease comes back. Next slide, please. So as Dr. Dr. McHale looked really beautifully highlighted, this is kind of how we look at treatment when we meet patients for the first time. So either you're the patient who we would consider for transplant, in which case we'll, we'll probably collect your stem cells at some point. And we might put those stem cells away in the freezer and, and do the transplant for a rainy day in, in the next line, or we'll do it as we as is generally our, our approach at the Moffitt, we'll, we'll do it up front. So, you know, we'll try and get that deep, that durable response and we'll bring in the transplant up front because that's where we feel, you know, the, the best approach for most of our patients are. But again, that's a discussion that you'll have back and forth with your doctor. And sometimes, you know, if your doctor isn't a transplant doctor, you'll come and see somebody like me at the Moffitt or wherever your local center is and you'll have that discussion. Should we do it now? Should we do it later? When's the best time? Um, and if you could just click on to the next, this is animation. Yep. So, or there are patients who we feel, you know what, I don't know that transplant is the right thing for you. Um, and because of the fantastic outcomes achieved now with um, often bringing in either a triplet combination, as Dr. McHale said, so RVD, or sometimes Cyborg D, if, if there's a reason to use, not to use lenalidomide, and sometimes that's that's because of kidney issues. Or now increasingly what we're doing is we're bringing in that antibody therapy, that daratumumab, or you might know it as Darzelex. And the outcomes achieved with Dara plus lenalidomide plus dexamethasone, that DRD combination, you know, the, the duration of response for patients in that study, you know, is just as long as some of the studies that have been reported out for transplant eligible patients where you have the induction, the transplant and the maintenance. You know, so so we haven't seen outcomes like that achieve without a transplant um, until now. So it's a really exciting time and patients who are felt not to be, you know, eligible or candidates for transplant, it doesn't mean that they won't have a very durable and deep response with, with these kind of approaches. And again, these are until toxicity or progression. So next next slide. So a bit similar to Dr. McHale's slide, so I've sort of grouped them all up for you. So you can imagine we have different color Lego blocks in our, in our toolkit and um, there's sort of different versions, different shaped red blocks, different shaped green blocks, but they all kind of are the same color. So there's the immunomodulators. A lot of you will have heard of or been treated with lenalidomide, otherwise known as Revlimid. There's another kind of brother or sister drug to that called pomalidomide. And that's when we often reach for, you know, after somebody has progressed on lenalidomide. There are these other drugs called the proteasome inhibitors. There's three of those. Two of them are, one of them is you give it as an injection into the tummy. That's your Velcade. Um, that one is the one that Dr. McHale said causes the numbness in the hands and feet. There's the Kyprolis or the carfilzomib, that's an IV infusion, at least for now. And then there's a little oral version called um, Exazomib or Nilaro, and they all work in a similar way. They've got slight differences between them, but they basically do the same job. There's the kind of traditional chemo drugs that basically interfere with how cells divide. Um, and we don't reach for the anthracyclines as much as we do for the alkylators, that's the middle gray box. Um, and those are drugs that we'll frequently use in particular, the melphalan is the one that we'll use for the transplant. 
steroids are with everything. So I think I've got a later slide. Steroids are like parsley. So at the very beginning of any new treatment cycle, we'll often sprinkle them on top and they often will boost and deepen responses. And sometimes they also work to sort of counteract some of the side effects of the other parts of the combination. And then there's these antibody treatments. So these are Y-shaped molecules that are designed to attach onto a particular target on the surface of the myeloma cells and flag them for destruction by your own immune system. And sometimes just the binding of the antibody to the target plasma cells will do the trick, Or, but it, the, the other end of the Y molecule will also drag over some of your own immune cells and kind of flag them and say, hey, get this guy, He's, he needs to be taken out. Um, and then there are other drugs, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later in the talk, that have totally different ways of working. Um, and so what we'll do is when we see any new patient, we'll look at what they had before, you know, how they are generally, any particular aspects of their disease. And I've got more slides coming on this. So next slide, please. So how do these drugs work? So they all work in slightly different ways, which is why we'll often combine them together, because they all do a slightly different job. If you think about it, kind of using Dr. McHale's argument of the army, some of them will be airplanes dropping bombs from up high. Some of them will be attacking on the ground. Some of them will be, you know, stealthy gunmen coming in from the side, snipers. Um, and so how do these drugs work? Well, steroids will just simply attach to receptors on the surface of plasma cells. And these receptors, when they're activated with steroids, high potency steroids, they just shrivel up and die. They just, the, the action of the steroids, and that's why they work really well at particular at the beginning or sometimes when we're getting things going with myeloma care. So sometimes we'll give just a big dose of steroids just for a few days, a little burst to try and calm down the disease. And that in, in and of itself will do a great job in, in reducing the amount of plasma cells in a person's body. As I said, the traditional chemos, they will interfere with how the cells divide. So they work really well, in particular when patients, some patients have myeloma cells that kind of are pretty dividing cells, they're what we call proliferative, they like to divide and grow. And sometimes those type of drugs work very well for those patients. And then because the plasma cells, their main job is to make antibodies. So their job is to make these um, protein molecules. That's their whole reason for being. Well, because of that, anything in the interior part of the cell that's to do with protein mechanics and so machinery on the inside is, is usually pretty busy. And it's so busy that actually, if you look down the microscope at a plasma cell, you can actually see the protein factory just by looking at the cell down a microscope. It's kind of expanded and it's very busy. So if you give drugs that interfere with that protein factory, so the proteasome inhibitors like Velcade, Carfilzomib, the Kyprolis drugs that you know, those interfere with the cellular dust bin. So you basically have the garbage guys go on strike the garbage cans fill up and fill up and fill up and basically the cell gets overloaded with protein garbage and, and dies. Um, the immunomodulators, so like Revlimid, thalidomide, how they work is they interfere with how the cells traffic the protein around. And so um, you can imagine then if, if you interfere with conveyor belts, then eventually things just back up and back up and, and the cell explodes. And then as I said, the other drugs, the antibodies, they bind onto the surface of the plasma cell and flag them for destruction. So you can imagine how if you had a really resistant cockroach myeloma cell, if you can attack it from all these fronts in combination, you have a greater chance of killing it. You can go to the next slide. And so why do we care about what you had before? So you'll often find if you go and see somebody, a, a new doctor, or you're talking to your existing doctor about, you know, the, the, a relapse or your disease coming back, we, we'll start getting into the real nuts and bolts of what you've had already. And why do we care? Well, there's this idea that every patient doesn't just have one myeloma, but they have multiple myelomas. So they have, even from the very beginning, some slightly different versions of the cancer and they might have um, aspects of their genetic makeup that is maybe a little bit more resistant or can develop resistance over time and then exposure to treatment might select out different 
what we say subclones. So plasma cells that are, you know, resistant to what you've had, for example. And so that is part of the reason this idea that the, the, the cancer can evolve over time to be increasingly resistant to what you've seen in the past is important to sort of understand when it comes to talking to your doctor about your myeloma coming back. And it's not that we can't go back to something you've had before. It'll depend on what we call the kinetics, like how fast it came back on those treatments or how long a duration of response you got out of them. Because if something worked really well for a really long time, then it's possible that you could go back to that thing and it would still work again in the future. Next slide, please. So <clears throat> I have no intention of talking to you about all these little letter combinations, but what I, all I wanted to say is that in theory, you know, doctors here in the United States, and we're very fortunate that we've got access to all of these things, can technically reach into their toolbox and pull out any number of combinations that might work well for you. And that's a, a fantastic opportunity, you know, for you as patients to access all of these different things that could work well um, in your particular situation. But it can, if you just go to the next slide, it can leave you feeling a bit like this. Um, where it's really hard to really get make sense of all the different options that you have. So how do we go through this decision-making process of what combination is going to be best for you? So if you go to the next slide. So these are the things that we think about. And so it's, it's not just a one-size-fits-all. We actually think about, okay, you know, what have you had before? How long did it work for? How old are you when, when you're dealing with your relapse? Did you have a transplant before? How are you feeling? Are you up and about? Are you like riding your bicycle? Or actually has the disease taken quite a toll on your body? Is pain really causing problems? You know, did you run into issues with, with numbness in your hands and your feet before? Because that might limit what would give you that might do make that worse. We don't want to make that worse. Um, what kind of genetics your myeloma has can often play a role. So there are certain genetic changes in the plasma cells that we look for that can sometimes help us predict what might work very well and and even in some cases actually isolate some patients so for example there's a um, a fish abnormality called 1114 and that that only patients with that particular abnormality will respond well to something called venetoclax which I'll get to a little bit later so all of these are things that we think about. How did you tolerate the treatment that you had before? What worked well? What worked, didn't work well? And these are all things that we think about as we're embarking upon the decision process for the next line of therapy. Next slide, please. And so, as I said before, a little bit of what goes into our decision making is how how your myeloma is changing. So is it coming back like really slowly? So if you were to plot out your blood tests, and it's really important as, as Kelly said, to understand your blood tests. Um, if you plot out your blood tests, are they kind of just inching up little by little, slowly, slowly, slowly over time, like that curve on the left versus things were completely under control and now all of a sudden it's like a, a COVID spike um, and, and the graph is going shooting up. That really does play a role in how we are going to think about next lines of treatment. Next slide, please. So, so these are the kind of things that we will sit down and, and talk to our patients about. So, you know, we'll look at all of those different aspects. You know, we'll look at your disease, the myeloma itself. We'll look at you, the person, and how you, you are currently feeling and how you felt in the past and how you did with prior treatments. And then we'll look at your other aspects of your health. So for example, we care very much about patients who've got issues with heart disease. When we're thinking about something like Kyprolis, which can have cardiac side effects. Um, we care very much about how your diabetes might be controlled. If we're gonna think about bringing in more high dose steroids and we might you know, do something about that, like bring in some insulin if you're not on it already, or at least have a long chat with your primary care doctor or an endocrinologist about managing your diabetes closely. So these are all things that we would think about as we're embarking on that discussion and that decision-making process about what, where to go next. Next slide. 
And then just to share with you something that I think is pretty cool that we're doing at the Moffat is we're also doing, um, and this is available for any patient who comes and we do a bone marrow to see how their disease is, is what the current state of play is, is we actually do this um, predictive modeling on test tubes. So we basically take a little bit of your plasma cells and we put them in all of these little mini wells with different combinations of drugs. And we try and get a sense of what combination is gonna work best for you based on the plasma cells that we have. And we can basically test up to 127 drugs all at the same time and do what's called like a mini clinical trial outside of your body, looking at all the different combinations and try and understand what's gonna work well, what do your plasma cells appear to be sensitive to and what combinations could we try rather than just trying to, to guess in a certain way. Next slide, please. So this is just an anonymized result that we can get for patients. And we can actually use this right now um, in terms of helping us with the decision-making process. So this patient, if you can see, all the red bars are, are where in the, little, in the little well, the drugs that are along the bottom, the plasma cells continue to grow. So they develop progressive disease. And then the blue and the yellow at the far right, these were combinations that worked well, that managed to make the plasma cells shrink down and die. So these are things that we hopefully will be able to do even more in the future. And there's going to be a huge explosion of, you know, research in looking at like the genetic makeup of your plasma cells, whether we can test for little DNA pieces in your bloodstream to try and get a sense of what they're going to respond to and what they're going to be resistant to. Next slide, please. So, so just to give you a flavor of, of what we could do at the first relapse, so I thought I'd just kind of share with you the things that we'll often reach for in our toolbox. Next slide. So these are the, the kind of commonly used players. So these are the people who'll be called off the bench to support you in your first relapse. So as I said, we talked about these guys, the proteasome inhibitors. You want to block up the dustbin. We'll usually pull in with those if possible. Um, if if <clears throat> you've either not seen them already, or if you have seen, for example, Revlimid already, we might bring in the sort of alternative version of it, pomalidomide, sometimes that can work even where lenalid lenalidomide or Revlimid has failed. And then we'll often bring in, if you haven't seen an antibody, we'll absolutely bring in an antibody at this point. And frequently used would be Darazelex or Daratumumab, but it, sometimes if you've seen that already, we'll think about um, Isotuximab. And as I said, we'll usually sprinkle a little bit of steroids on top, at least for, you know, the initial period where we get things under control. And then we often try, as, as Dr. McHale says, I'll often try and pull back on the steroids because, you know, a lot of my patients refer to them as Tyrannosaurus dex. You know, it's, it's that awful elephant in the room once a week where you're fighting with your spouse, you can't sleep, you want to eat everything in sight. You know, it's not nice to be on those for years and years and years. So we try and pull those back once we have things a bit more under control. Next slide, please. And then <clears throat> there's all the other aspects, you know, that I think it's important. And I know Kathy's probably going to talk about this, but myeloma isn't just about dishing out drugs, you know, to keep your disease under control. It's also about dealing with the potential side effects of those drugs and making sure that you tolerate your treatment combination as well as possible and that we take care of all the other aspects of you know you and it's important that we think about you know when it comes to the proteasome inhibitors that cause the numbness in the hands and the feet sometimes we find supplements or vitamins or medicines to help control that numbness are very helpful for patients we always want to make sure you're on a medicine that prevents you from getting shingles same thing for the monoclonal antibodies. And sometimes we give patients antibiotics just to make sure they don't end up with a nasty chest infection, at least in the early stages of bringing in combinations like that, because chest infections are a big deal for myeloma patients. And similarly with the immunomodulatory agents, we'll often think about bringing in um, a blood thinner or at least an aspirin, just to make sure you don't run into issues of blood clots and, and other ways that we can help manage your side effects. And some patients get diarrhea, some patients get skin irritation, we might bring in creams for those. Uh, next slide, please. So how do we define and measure success? Well, we want to make you feel better. We want to prevent anything bad from happening, if we can, from your disease. So that's, 
you know, we don't want any da more damage to occur to your kidneys. We don't want you to make any more bony lesions if we can prevent that at all. And we obviously want to make sure that you live longer if that's something that we can achieve with treatment, which is ultimately what we're trying to do. And then, you know, in the back of all our minds is always, can we achieve something that feels as close as possible to a cure? Next slide. And so <clears throat> Dr. McHale kind of hinted to this a little bit about the depth and duration of response, but we do, we're always chasing, you know, trying to really deepen that response. So you might hear your doctors say in response to your blood work, you've, you know, you've had a partial response. That's where, you know, your blood protein that we follow that M band or the light change has gone down by 50% or so. When you get down to 90%, we get very excited. When it's totally not measurable at all, then we start jumping up and down a little bit. And then when we get you down to the point where we do a bone marrow, not only can we not see any plasma cells with our eyes and the microscope, we can't find them with some special tests like flow cytometry, but we can't even using super sensitive techniques find one in a million. That's when we start talking about something called MRD, so minimal residual disease or or measurable disease, we can't find anything left. That's when we start getting very excited. And the closer we get patients into that position, either in the first line of therapy or in any subsequent lines, then we start getting excited that they will maintain these nice deep responses. And the idea is that that's what we're going after for cure. We want to make sure that the myeloma cells are completely gone, we can't see them anywhere, and that we're achieving those really deep responses. Next slide, please. So what about, okay, so you've had your first line of therapy, you've had your second line of therapy, oh, is that it for me? Absolutely not. We've got loads more tools in our toolbox. So what, what would happen then at second relapse or what would happen after that? Next slide. So these are all the things that we're looking at as myeloma doctors. And I don't want you to get overwhelmed by the, the diagram, but I just wanted to highlight to you, if you can just click the slide. These are all the things that we have right now in our hands to play with, but there's loads of other things coming. So I just wanted to give you a flavor of these are the things we have right now to reach for. Some of them are on clinical trials, some of them are in our hands, but there's all of these other ways that we can either influence and attack the myeloma cell itself or all of the you know, garden around it that's actually supporting its existence. And so these are the ways that we're thinking conceptually in the future about how to treat myeloma patients better to achieve these deep responses that last. Next slide. Oh, that's my toolbox, yes. So these are all the things that you could look for and I, I don't want to, to get into it, but these are all the things that your doctor could look to in terms of trying to select what combinations would work well for any patient who's had more than three prior lines of therapy. Next slide. But what about the newer things? So you, some of you may or may not know about things that are coming out that are new. Um, some of them are called antibody drug conjugates, ADCs, selenexors, relatively new for myeloma. And then there's CARS, which is obviously something I'm very excited about. That's why I came to work at the Moffitt and I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit about those. Next slide. So what's an antibody drug conjugate? So it's an antibody, it's that same Y-shaped molecule, and attached to that antibody is a little tiny piece of chemotherapy that's really quite potent, that we can't give patients normally by mouth or into their veins because it causes side effects. But if you can attach a teeny tiny piece to an antibody that then attaches on to a tumor cell, in this case, a myeloma cell, and then the binding gets the whole thing internalized. Then inside the plasma cell, the digestion machinery releases the piece of chemo and boom. Can you click on, I've got a little animation. Yep, torpedo, right in to the, to the target cell that you're after. So you basically are delivering this tiny piece of chemotherapy right into the tumor cell that you're trying to kill. And that's what uh, Belantamab or Belamaf, that's the first one that's now available to use for patients, is, is exactly like this. Uh, next slide. And then the Selenexor is a different uh, approach. So there are these little shuttles inside the nucleus. The nucleus is the brain of the cell. And there are these little shuttles that basically send information in and out of the brain. And 
basically Selenexor attaches into the shuttle and prevents it from sending messages often about like tumor messages like grow forever never die it basically blocks that messenger and works extremely well in certain patients with myeloma next slide please and <clears throat> these are, are things that we have right now to use for patients who've who've usually what we call is their their triple refractory so Dr. McHale at the beginning talked about the three classes that we're interested in. So the MEDs, the proteasome inhibitors, and the antibodies. So if you have had all of those three classes of drugs, often in combination, sometimes different versions sequentially, and your myeloma is still coming back and, and isn't responding to those three things anymore, that's what we call patients who are triple refractory. And these other drugs, so they're working in a totally different way, like Balamaf or Selenexor, they can work even though patients have got, you know, progressed through all these different lines, but the duration of responses are, are not that long. So patients might do well for a little while. Um, and some patients will have another year of survival on these agents, but the, the sort of average amount of time for patients to respond to them is usually only about three months. So yes, they work, but not for like a really long time. And the reason I'm telling you about this is because I want to show you some more information about what's newer and what's coming and why that's so exciting. So we can, you know, access these agents right now. They're on the shelf for us to use and prescribe. So we can get patients combinations with Selenexor. We can get patients combinate. We can give patients Balamaf or Balantamab. That's the antibody drug conjugate torpedo one. Um, but they often don't work for very long, especially when we give them by themselves. And they do have some side effects. So some patients have an awful lot of trouble with eye side effects with the Balantamab, and we're very careful about making sure they go to see eye doctors very regularly and make sure that their eyes are not suffering on these agents. And then the Selenexor can have issues for patients causing nausea, um, tiredness, and I'm, I'm sure that Kathy's gonna cover these in a little bit more depth in her talk. If you go to the next slide. So, why am I sort of talking about all these things that don't work for very long? Well, that's because I'm really excited about these guys. So what are CAR T's? Everyone's talking about them. They're exciting. Um, so basically what a CAR T cell is, is often right now, at least, they're, they're T cells from patients themselves. So their own patients' immune cells. So they're of that army of white cells that Dr. McHale talked about. They're a subset. Um, of those guys called T cells. And if we take patients' own T cells out and in a cool experiment, we basically engineer them genetically so that they recognize, they express on their surface something that recognizes your myeloma cells, patient's myeloma cells. And then we put them back into the patient. Those guys will go attach onto the plasma cell and go crazy. They will say, I gotta kill you. And they will also bring over, they'll recruit the person's own immune system to say, look, you've had your glasses on. You need to see these guys. Look, I'm flagging them for you. Come over here and attack them. And so basically what they do is you, once they're activated, they destroy the myeloma cells. They can hang around for a long time so they can remember. And if they see a plasma cell in the future, they can attack it. And because they're made from your own body, you shouldn't reject them the way that, you know, any of you who've ever heard about transplant where you take something from someone else, sometimes there's an issue where your own body will recognize that thing as foreign and will reject it. So that's the general concept of CAR T cells. You can go to the next slide. So this is what happens when a patient comes to see me at the Moffat and we, we go ahead with CAR T cells. So the patient will come, this is uh, number one there, they'll come and just like if you go for a stem cell, we'll take out their T cells. So you won't need to have the injections to, to get stem cells out because we'll just take your ordinary T cells that are floating around and then we'll send them off. Number two, we'll send them off to the factory to get manufactured into cars, into these little army of T cells that will recognize your tumor. And then when they're ready, and when the patient is ready and well, we'll bring them back to the hospital. We'll give them a, a type of chemotherapy that they won't often have seen before that's generally very well tolerated. And what that chemotherapy really does is it 
it creates a receptive environment for the T cells, for the CAR T cells that are coming back, ready to attack your tumor. And then after they've had that, what's called lymphodepletion chemotherapy, then we give them the CAR T cells and often we'll admit them for a period of observation to make sure that everything goes okay. Because, because these cells are alive, it's hard to predict exactly what's going to happen. And sometimes patients run into issues where the attack of the infused CAR T cells is so potent that they will release some chemicals and that can have issues in terms of patients needing some extra supports in the hospital. If you go to the next slide. So why is this so exciting? Well, in patients who were what we call triple class refractory or sometimes even had, had seen five different classes of drugs. And in, in this particular study, which is the one that led to approval, um, most patients had had at least six lines of therapy and some had had up to 13 prior lines of therapy, if you can believe that. The, the number of patients that responded to the CAR T cell infusion was basically eight out of 10. And of those patients who got the bigger doses, the ones that we now give patients routinely, you know, a third of them had no measurable protein left, had nothing, no myeloma cells to find in their bone marrow, and had basically achieved a very deep response. And those responses were lasting at least a year or sometimes 18 months in the patients who got the higher doses and had a good response. And the best part of it was that in that period where their disease was responding, they were on no other anti-myeloma therapy. So they were off all medicines, they weren't on maintenance, this was a one-time treatment, and they had that long duration response. And if you remember from a slide two slides ago, these are patients who, with the sort of available tools in our toolbox at that point, could have expected maybe three months of improvement in their disease, not a year, a year and a half from a one-time treatment. So this is very exciting. Next slide. And so this is just to show you that with longer follow-up now of, of two years, some patients who achieved a response, they're getting almost closer to two years out of their treatment. And even in patients who are have like really high amounts of myeloma going into it, or maybe they've got myeloma outside of their bone marrow, what we call extramedullary disease, where the myeloma cells have lost their homing mechanism to the bone marrow. Often they're very hard to treat. Seven out of 10 patients responded. So this was super exciting in the myeloma world and something that we all, you know, were very excited to be a part of. Next slide. And so this treatment, this CAR, CAR T therapy was approved in March of this year. And it's the first ever cell-based therapy for the treatment of myeloma. Um, patients had to have had at least four prior lines of therapy. So if a patient comes to see me, if they're only on their first line of therapy, this isn't something that I can reach for. Although we will have trials coming to use it in earlier lines of therapy. Um, there are some limitations. So right now, we don't have tons of slots for patients because of the manufacturing limitations of the company that makes these cells. But I think that's only going to improve as time goes on. So as of today, there is a bit of a wait list for patients that we see, but I think that that's going to get better over time. And this is something that we're very excited to have at the Moffitt. And we've treated more patients with this FDA approved products than any other center in the US. Next slide, please. So, you know, these are, there's a ton of studies using CAR T and myeloma patients. So at the time I looked uh, last week, it was about 150 trials that were currently registered. Um, and so it's very exciting. We talked a little bit about this, about how right now the studies are enrolling patients who have had lots of prior lines of therapy. Um, the cells are living products. And so they do have this potential to cause some side effects. So they're generally only being administered at high throughput like very specialist centers that have the capability to manage these patients but a lot of patients you know seven to eight out of ten will respond and I think what we're working really hard on and what I'm working in terms of my research is how do we predict those patients who are going to get those great responses and how do we improve outcomes for patients who haven't done as well and that's something that I'm working really hard on here at the Moffitt. Next slide. So this is something just to bear in mind in terms of patients with myeloma, I think 
there's so many new treatments coming. There's so many exciting combinations. It's really important for you to empower yourself to know, are there trials that I could participate on? Is there something new that I could be a part of and get access to? So it's always important to, to know at least, you know, in, in the Florida area, if that's where you're based, there's a ton of centers that are participating in trials. Certainly Moffitt have got a lot of trials open. We're very excited to be participating in the next wave of treatment options for patients. And these are some ways that you can find out. So there's a, a website and I know the IMF also have a, a very clever portal that you can access um, to try and understand what, what trials there might be for your particular stage of disease of your myeloma. Next slide, please. So very quickly, because I know I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get in trouble for running over time. So in terms of other options that you can access now on clinical trials, one of the others that are very exciting is called a bispecific T-cell engager. So what does that mean? So what that means is it's an anti kind of like an antibody. So those Y-shaped molecules that we talked about, except they kind of fuse them together. They're like a mutant and they get one bit to attach to your plasma cell and they get the other bit to attach to your own immune system, these T cells, and basically pull them over and say, hey, attack these guys. Um, and that has a very profound effect on a lot of patients, again, who've seen lots of treatments in the past. We see some of these same side effects as I talked about with the cars, where patients, if they have a really impressive effect of giving this, this sort of linker molecule to get the immune system to attack your plasma cells, that can cause the release of these cytokines. And so those same kind of side effects are common. If you go to the next slide. And so there's a lot of debate in the myeloma world about what's better. So obviously what's nice about the CAR T cells is it's right now at least a one-time treatment. You come, you have your T cell, it hopefully works well for you and then you go off and you're awful treatment. But there, there are some pretty unique side effects that we have to be careful about monitoring patients for. Um, whereas if you can give a bispecific agent, you can get it in your local community clinic. It's often something that is probably less associated with these kind of scary side effects. But I think as we get better, both agents will be easier to give in the community. And I think that it's possible that we'll see trials in the future where you give both agents. Next, next slide, please. So here's just a quick snapshot, right now at least, of what we have open in the Moffitt. So we've got some great trials open for patients who are newly diagnosed, for patients who are going forward for transplant, and we've got some nice trials looking at maintenance strategies. We've got some great CAR T cells coming, great CAR T cell trials open now and more to come. And then we've got all of these great combinations for patients with relapsed or refractory disease. Next slide. So the only other little thing I'll talk about for caregivers or family members is we also have this trial open, which is being coordinated out of Harvard by Irene Gobriel. She's quite a very prolific myeloma researcher, but basically looking at, as Dr. McHale said, this high-risk population. So people who are of African-American descent or who have first-degree family members diagnosed with myeloma. If you are interested in participating in a screening study, looking at you know, whether you are, your family members are at increased risk or if you're from this kind of a population, this is something that we have open at the Moffitt and that you can look into. If you go to the next slide. And basically what they're doing is they're gonna screen 30,000 30, people and basically try and better understand how we identify patients, how we risk stratify those who haven't yet been diagnosed. Um, and this is something that we have. And basically if you click onto the animation part that comes up, you can, you can sign yourself up for this. You don't even have to have a referral to the Moffat. This is something that you can sign up for yourself they'll send you a, a blood kit in the post. You can go and have it and you can get your own results back. So this is also something that we're participating in and we're interested in for patients on a sort of bigger scale outside of just our myeloma cohort that we see on a regular basis. Next slide. So to summarize, and I think I'm just about on time. Um, so this is, this is just a timeline to, for you guys to understand how exciting it's been to be a myeloma doctor in the last sort of number of years, all of the different tools that we have that have come out and are now in our hands available to use. And I just wanted to highlight to you that 
you know, as we have more tools in our toolbox, our outcomes are improving, survival is improving, and it's only going to get better in the future. And I think we're getting closer and closer to really finding out how to treat patients on an individual basis and how to really achieve those deep, durable responses. And ideally, you know, my goal is to have patients off therapy. That's my that's my real goal is to try and have patients not on treatments, no lenalidomide in their suitcases, they go on holidays. So if you go to the, the next slide. So this is, I think, what the next wave of trials is going to look like. How do we get these deeper responses? How can we use maybe fewer drugs or cleverer combinations for shorter periods to really see how we can do more for less, get those long lasting remissions, be off therapy and looking for that cure? Next page, uh, next slide, please. This is a highlight, all the great people at Moffat that I work with, and we'd be happy to see anyone who wanted to come and get an opinion about the my their myeloma or their care at any point. And you can self-refer if that's something you're interested in. Okay. Wow. Some time. Wow. Good. I like your, your, uh, your army uh, analogies. Uh, Dr. Freeman, that was fantastic. And the final thing you put there, off therapy. Yeah. That's fantastic. I mean, that's, I'm, I'm, I'm really passionate about that, Kelly. I have to say, it's why I'm so excited about CAR T. Um, you know, it's, it's fantastic what we've achieved, but I, I really want us to get to the point where patients are not on treatment forever. Well, I think you held your breath for 45 minutes. So I was impressed that you had all that out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go to Dr. Joe. He's going to moderate a bunch of questions and take it away, Dr. Joe. Yeah. Let me just say also Kara, fantastic talk. Um, you did not just watch an episode of Star Trek. This really is what we're doing with really? patients. I mean, it sounds uh, so strange that we can take cells out of you and manufacture them and multiply them and give them back to you. I mean, it really does sound uh, futuristic, mm -hmm. but it, it really is the present. So thank you so much. So we're going to go through a little bit of a rapid fire Q&A here, um, and then we'll um, uh, get a chance to uh, listen, from, listen to Kathy. So um, a couple of questions are related to the first session. I'll answer quickly regarding the transplant study. Didn't the results show it was more effective? This is, I think, referring to tandem transplant in high-risk patients. So yes, there was a European study that showed that giving two transplants might be better than one, especially in high-risk patients. But I go back to the comment I made before, which was their chemotherapy regimen before transplant I would suggest was inferior to what we can do now, where they didn't include both a proteasome inhibitor and an immunomodulatory drug. And when we've uh, conducted similar studies here, we have not seen that benefit of tandem transplant. And then secondly, are there any benefits um, or mechanism to store stem cells at early stage of illness for later use? This is something we are thinking about and looking at. There's a whole spectrum that I didn't go into a lot of detail, this concept of MGUS and smoldering myeloma and active myeloma. I'll come back to smoldering in a moment because someone asked a great question about it. But um, we do recognize that earlier in the disease course, people's stem cells are less beaten down. They're a little bit more easily accessible. This is part of the rationale of doing a transplant early than late as well. Although some people may decide, there's a patient who wrote here a note about they decided to collect their stem cells and then wait for their transplant. And I think that's reasonable. In the French study that I showed, there were patients who didn't get the transplant right at the start. They waited until their first relapse and they did very well. So that should be a discussion with your doctor, obviously, to look at what options there are. Uh, but yes, we are looking at when is the best time to collect stem cells and maybe even could we collect T cells early on for a CAR T cell, ther uh, CAR -T -cell therapy later. T cells in particular over time get a bit of a beating in myeloma. So we think as, as Kira showed, as we use a trans, a CAR T cell earlier and earlier, it'll be uh, even more effective. Right. All right, so um, here are so many great questions and more and more of them are just pouring in Kelly. So this is good. Um, so uh, here's a question that says, is the screening for many drugs with bone marrow biopsies that was mentioned available at Moffitt right now? So I think you talked a bit about that. Right MRI now. Program. Yeah, uh, yeah, right now. It's not, um, it's not like, so how do I describe it? So anyone who comes can get that result. It might not always uh, influence the initial decision, but we can get that information. It's still predominantly a research tool, but we are using it to make decisions and to help with decision-making. 
Okay, great. Um, so I think you've covered a little bit about uh, Emma. I see another great question from one of our regulars, Steve, who's also from the Florida area, who's welcoming you, by the way, Dr. Freeman, to, to Florida. Steve is just an absolutely wonderful um, advocate for myeloma and uh, very involved in, in our work and was asking if there are sometimes differences between what you see in the lab and what you see in, in people when you do a study like the Emma study. Oh, absolutely. And, and as we know, so any of you who've had a bone marrow done, sometimes what we get out in the liquid part isn't necessarily as representative as what we get out when we do the biopsy, where we take the piece of bone and we do the actual biopsy part. Because the myeloma cells are kind of sticky. They like to like cling on to the bone marrow infrastructure. And so it's it's not perfect, you know, and sometimes the, the mismatch between what we get out in the liquid part that we can really test genetically and look at well, it doesn't, it's not perfectly representative of what's actually happening. And remember also that it's only a tiny representation of your whole bone marrow, right? So you've got plasma cells in the bone marrow that you have in all your bones, but we're only going to look at that one small bit for this analysis. So it's, it's definitely not perfect. And I think Going forward, there's lots of exciting technologies to look at, for example, looking at circulating DNA from your, your plasma cells that might be floating around in your bloodstream. And that might give us even more broader representation of all those little plasma cell clones that are in your body. So Kathy, here's a good one. You've already heard my take on steroids, but can steroids be stopped while on maintenance, although no transplant has taken place? Well, certainly, I mean, you know, it's funny, um, you know, steroids, out of all the patients when we're giving them therapy, they always say, I'll take anything you'll give me, just don't give me steroids. So I'm sure we've all heard that. And we just know how difficult um, steroids are and just kind of wreak havoc with everybody's life. You know, the highs are high, the lows are low, um, it can cause depression and all kinds of issues. And, you know, I think that initially, um, you know, as, as both you and Dr. Freeman said, that obviously we know, you know, steroids really work well against the myeloma cell. But then after time, you know, we can certainly, you know, pull back and make dose modifications. Um, we see that when we're using maintenance therapy, say post uh, transplant, we don't have patients necessarily on, uh, you know, on um, steroids, we just have them say on maintenance Revlimid. So we can pull back or a lot of times physicians are just using prednisone or using methylpred. So to, you know, combat those, because they have a shorter, you know, acting, um, you know, half-life in, in these side effects aren't as bad. So we, do, we can pull back and, you know, we obviously want to individualize the steroids and how it affects everybody differently. Great. So a couple of questions here about the post-transplant setting. So someone asks, um, can you get Revlimid resistance even at low dose after a long time? And the answer, unfortunately, is yes. I mean, it's like any other drug people can unfortunately, uh, develop resistance. We typically, um, if someone even progresses or has relapse on a low dose of Revlimid, we tend to discard the Revlimid and go to a different therapy. Uh, because even though we might get a little bit of benefit from increasing the dose and adding something else, we're, we're expecting too much of that, of that something else. And then someone is asking, what is the risk of secondary malignancies? This is a huge topic that we could spend a lot of time on, but let me try and summarize it like this. That sadly, we know that all myeloma patients actually are at risk of a second cancer. We've always thought about it as three reasons why. One, perhaps someone's inherent genetics just puts them at risk of different cancers. Number two, sometimes we give treatment that can affect cells in the body that may induce them to become cancerous, typically um, other blood cancers or even solid tumors. And then thirdly, what we sometimes call the incidentaloma, which just means cancer patients tend to be followed more closely. They tend to get mammograms and colonoscopies and blood tests and so we can pick up things along the way. We have learned over time that when we give drugs like lenalidomide after a transplant, so both the melphalan and lenalidomide over long periods of time, it can increase that risk. And, and the numbers are all over the board, but I, I try to summarize it by saying that risk of getting a second cancer, no matter what we do is about 5%. It appears that when we add Revlimid, it goes up to 7%. We got to put that 2% increase in the context of we already have a cancer that Revlimid maintenance can not only keep people in remission for longer, has actually now been shown to prolong survival. So I think we still go with what we think is going to be the best treatment for the myeloma. 
but it's particularly important that cancer patients ensure that they follow the routine screening, that their doctors look for any changes that may be consistent with the second cancer, especially um, as they're being followed up on lenalidomide maintenance. Um, here's a question, um, another COVID question. So maybe Kira, I'll give you this COVID question this time because I gave Kathy one last time. Um, if you do not develop antibodies after the Pfizer vaccine and booster, what options do you have? So this is such a challenging thing for myeloma patients is that um, as we know, part of the myeloma itself and how the myeloma cells exist in the bone marrow, they suppress your normal immune system. So they suppress part of your normal immune system that would be responsible for making antibodies. So what I always tell my patients is, the reality is no matter what we do, you probably won't make as good a response to any vaccine as, as a normal healthy individual who doesn't have myeloma. And that being said, it's super important to, to get these vaccines anyway, not just for COVID, but for all the other things that we vaccinate against, because you are at such increased risk of infection that any bit of benefit that is conferred to you is going to be protective and is definitely going to be better than nothing. So yes, myeloma patients don't make as good of an antibody response, but we don't really know that an antibody response is the only way of measuring whether somebody is going to actually do well in terms of fighting an infection, because there's other aspects of getting a vaccine that we can't measure well with tests and that might help you fight an infection. And what I mean by that is there's other parts of the army, like the T cell response, the dendritic cell response, that will help you fight an infection that we can't measure with a simple blood test. So yes, if you get a vaccine to COVID or influenza, you probably won't make that same level of antibodies as a normal person, but you still will probably be protected to a certain extent, albeit not to the same extent as a normal person. Does that answer that question? Yeah, no, I think I think it does. I think it does. And then of course, you know, we we talk a lot about the vaccines, but as Kathy noted earlier, we do have a lot better treatments now than even a few months ago for for uh, COVID itself if people develop it. A couple of questions about transplant eligibility. What is the current transplant mortality risk, and how does it increase? with lung comorbidity, and then someone, um, perhaps the same person asked the question, you know, I've reached a stringent complete remission, but still MRD positive after six cycles of VRD being considered a borderline candidate for transplant due to lung comorbidity. Tran harvest completed, would you recommend transplant now or continuing additional VRD? Um, you know, when people ask really specific questions, we really have to let you discuss this with your physician because there's lots of other factors that go into this. But I think we have proven as a principle today that it is legitimate to collect and wait when people get a deep response with their induction strategy. Um, the transplant mortality risk continues to drop. I tell my patients now it's actually well below 1% as we are very careful in whom we select. And the lung issue, as was questioned, is, is one piece of it. There are lots of other issues that go into that. And so it's hard to be much more specific than that. But that's, um, that's I think, probably the best way to, to answer that in the short term. Uh, Kathy, are there any centers that are doing uh, CAR-T or transplant without blood transfusions? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm that I'm not sure. Um, I know that uh, they have the the non blood cell transfusion uh, uh, transplants at the UPenn. I mean, I'm not sure about other centers. Yeah, I think I think the, the probably easiest way to answer this is that we don't like to give transfusions until we have to. Yeah, but we can't always predict people's response. There are certain situations where we know there are certain patients that do not want transfusion. Um, and we try to do our best to minimize that, but uh, it's impossible to ever guarantee that we cannot. We, we just still have not developed other products that can support a patient's bone marrow function as well as an actual transfusion. Mm -hmm. uh, Kelly, I'm going to take a couple more questions. And I'll turn it back to you, boss, because okay. I know that they're, they're still streaming in here, which is great. Um, someone asked a question, are there any trials or treatments being considered for low-risk patients with smoldering myeloma? Really good question. The short answer is, you know, we always want to answer questions that need to be that need to be answered. I think the way I think of it is, 
we, as I mentioned, we have this huge spectrum um, where uh, sometimes I say, because I'm a morning runner, I like to go running in the morning. If I'm running towards a cliff, hopefully Kathy will see me getting close to the cliff and rescue me before the end and maybe Kira will help her. Um, not that I'm going that fast. Anyway, um, <laughs> and so we used to say that myeloma was when people actually were falling off the cliff because you had to have crab criteria. And then we realized, wait a minute, if you're like 50 feet from the cliff, you're gonna be in trouble. So we kind of drew the line there with the slim crab criteria and said, if you're 50 feet or closer, you're so close to being in trouble, we need to treat you, we need to pull you back. I think we all realize that that 50 yard line or 50 uh, uh, foot line is maybe not perfect. And maybe we need to come back a bit further. So we're doing lots of trials in what we now call high risk smoldering myeloma, those people that are closer to the line. For people much further back, we're not sure. We want to be careful because there's a lot of people there and they may never get towards the cliff. And as we heard today, every treatment comes with risk. I'd like to find a way to reprogram my GPS so I never run towards the cliff, right? <laughs> so, so that's that's a, a form of prevention or cure, but, but we're not quite there yet. So yes, there are lots of studies looking at smoldering myeloma. Most of them are focused in that area further towards. And then maybe I'll take this one last one for you, uh, Kira, because uh, we know you have to uh, sadly leave us, but here's a great question for you uh, and maybe a bit of a prophetic question for the future. Uh, what is better, CAR T or transplant? Oh, so that's really tricky. And um, I don't think I've got an answer right now. What I will say is, I think it's very hard to outperform the immunological reset of transplant for the majority of patients who can, can have it. That the, until we find a way to engineer the grass so that it's not, it's not allowing the weeds to grow. And at, at the moment, the only thing we've really figured out how to do that with is, is a big dose of mofilan. And that's what I'm really working on with CAR T is, is how do we make that grass you know, how do we help the grass to flourish and to keep the weeds at bay? And and right now, I think um, CAR T isn't ready to replace transplant because that's probably and, and that's what's coming. That's the next generation of trials that we're doing. Is like, can we replace transplant with CAR T? And I'm so excited to be a part of that. But I I don't think we're there just yet. So it's, it's let's watch this space. I think that's the safe thing to say. Yeah. These, these are, Kathy, did you want to say something about that as well? Oh, no, I, I totally agree. I think it's a perfect answer. I mean, we still, there's still more research to be done. Absolutely. To get Absolutely. the answer. I, and I think we are working towards that. I think one thing I'd like to emphasize at the end of this section that I think Kara presented so well is that what excites us the most about CAR T is not only just that we see such a deep response and a durable response, is that it really gives the potential to having nothing for a nothing. period of time. You know, as I call it with my patients, nada, that's my favorite drug, right? The price is right. People are very <laughs> compliant with it. Uh, the side effects are excellent. I know I, I'm being a little facetious here, but, but to stop all treatment for periods of time would be really our nirvana. Uh, and that's what we hope to achieve. Right. All right, Kelly, we got through as many as we could. We might be able to get some uh, covered after Kathy's done, but I'll turn back to the host with the most. Okay, I'll be quick. Uh, folks that are listening. Bye, Bye Dr. Okay. Freeman. Bye, Dr. Freeman. Um, engineering is a key word that's coming up a lot more in myeloma. Can you imagine that they're engineering a successful program or treatment that might ultimately get you off the drugs? That's fantastic. And Dr. Freeman uh, had to go, but her, her tape or her, her slides will be available after this meeting. I advise you to get another legal pad and some more pencils because it was an enlightening, enlightening program. Yeah. Now with great and without further ado, I love to introduce a friend of mine, Kathy Colson from the IMF Nurse Leadership Board. She has a lot of acronyms after her name, so take note. And she's going to go into how to manage myeloma symptoms and side effects. Incredibly important again. So take it away, Kathy. 
Okay, thank you, Kelly. Thank you, everybody. I'm thrilled to be here. My background is um, with a nice palm tree there, and I wish that I was in Florida and not in Boston, where it's very cold. But I'm excited to be here. You know, I've, I've been a clinical research uh, nurse in multiple myeloma for over 20 years at the Dana Farber Cancer Center, and I'm just thrilled, you know, that I've been a part of a lot of the drug development over the years. So it's very exciting, and obviously, we know we have a lot of new drugs in the pipeline. So next slide, please. So anyway, it's very important, you know, I think that as uh, Dr. Freeman said and Dr. You know, McHale is that, you know, we, you as the patient are the, are the center. We want to look at you individually and take care of the patient. And it really takes a village, I'll say, to give you the best care overall. So it's very important that we have a multidisciplinary team that's gonna take care of you. So you have your general um, hematologist that give you the diagnosis of myeloma, who'll probably refer you to a myeloma specialist because they have expert knowledge in that field. And from there, you can have allied healthcare and they play a vital role in services to improve health and well-being. You know, your physical therapist, your nutritionist, your audiologist if you need it, etc. Also, when you're going through this journey with uh, multiple myeloma and getting that diagnosis, you certainly could use and probably need some family and support network and asking your care team that for referrals, for counseling, you, we, we can offer social work counseling, also financial counselors. And so, you know, obviously dealing with this and, and we're talking to your family about the disease, um, it's very important to have some type of support. It's always important, and I always emphasize this with my patients, is that your primary care provider is key. And that because you have myeloma, you still need to see your primary care. Patients with multiple myeloma are living a very long time. So it's very, very important that they're part of your care team, that you see them yearly for your physical exam. They're the ones that need to be giving you your flu vaccine. They're the ones that will be scheduling your mammograms and you know, drawing PSA testing, scheduling um, colonoscopies. And so very importantly, you know, I tell the patients that we're there, we want to take care of your myeloma, but it's very important to have somebody out there in the community that you're going to be seeing if, you know, if you need to call somebody, if you feel like you have a cold or upper respiratory infection. And then of course, we can refer to the subspecialists. Um, if patients need an endocrinologist, a cardiologist, somebody to look after their kidneys. And so we also that is part of the care. So it's important, you know, to understand these different roles and you can ask your physicians or any of the nurses that work with the myelomas team is to, if you need a referral, they're there to help you out. Uh, next slide, please. So it's very important when you're seeing the doctors and you know it's and we're listening to Dr. Uh, Mikhail, you know, we want to the, we want you to be a part of the decision making process in your treatment. So, you know, we give you lots and lots of options when we talk about treatments and they're overwhelming. And I think it's very important for you to ask a lot of good questions. Um, you know, the doctors want to hear from you. We want to individualize uh, patients care. And so when you're sitting there, in the doctor's office, it's overwhelming and they want to hear from you and they want to know what your major concerns are. So ask for time to consider options. Don't think that, oh, they'll get mad at me because I can't give them an answer now and it's going to take more time to come back. And that's not true. We want you to be very much informed in your decision for your treatment. Um, understanding options, which is very key, is to use reliable sources of information. So I know with the IMF website, which is, you know, you can get to is www.myeloma.org. There are lots of tools there that can give you some guidance for discussion tools that you can bring these cards into, you know, your visit with the doctor. So it's important you can go on and download those and bring them into your doctor's office. Um, also, we talk about use caution, considering stories of um, personal experiences, like if you're in support groups, because sometimes it could be not the right information that you need. But it's important to create a dialogue and express your goals, your values, your preferences. Um, you know, as Dr. Freeman was mentioning, some patients, you know, don't want to have to be traveling with their revenue when they're going on to a holiday or vacation. Um, some patients want to go to Florida and spend the winter, and they're just worried about taking their therapy and how they going to get it. 
Um, you know, we have younger and younger patients with myeloma. They may want, not want to get an IV drug or have to come in for a subcutaneous. And so you need to talk about your goals, your values, and a lot of patients that need to work and support their families and they can't be coming into clinic. So the doctors really want to hear from you so that you both equally can, you know, arrive at a treatment decision together. Next slide, please. So preparation, preparation for your appointment is in the COVID era that we see is that, you know, it's very important to write down your questions or concerns. I just talked about on the last slide is that the, the IMF there provides, you know, some tools to help guide you in your appointment. So I think it's really important to download that, you know, be prepared for your appointment, you know, bring in your know, current medications and supplements. There's so many times when I'll say to a patient, you know, what do you, what are you taking? What is the dose? how many times a day and they don't have any idea. And this is very, very informa important information for us to update your records. Um, also make sure you talk about any uh, medical or life changes since your last visit, any current symptoms that you have, how have they changed, have they improved, have they gotten worse? And when you do go to your appointment, remember your mask and ask your most important questions first. And certainly make sure you have a good understanding of your treatment plan and what the next steps are. Have a list of who to contact. Again, this is all very important. And you know, it's also good to have a, a caregiver with you just to have another set of ears because a lot of times we're getting lots of information and it's hard for us to remember um, what's going on. And so when you're at home, you know, take uh, precautions to stay healthy, of course, good hand washing at all times, you know, stay away from people if they're sick, communicate with other members of your healthcare team, whether it's your pharmacist, your cardiologist, your endocrinologist, take your medications as directed and follow up with members of your healthcare team if you're having any side effects that are not agreeable so the adjustments can be made. Next slide. So consider telemedicine. I find this to be interesting because I really find that telemedicine really does work for the patients. It's, um, I think you have the MD's full attention when you are on a telemedicine visit. Um, so I think you can really accomplish a lot. So check with your healthcare provider to see if telemedicine is an option. Um, Cause I think it's really, it's another way to have not having to travel, especially if you have transportation issues. I mean, during COVID, we know that a lot of uh, visits were being done by telemedicine. So just it's I think it's a great option for patients to have. You can ask the telemedicine process. Usually somebody, you know, um, in you know within the the uh, hospital, you know, will let you know about how to make the appointment. Um, and you may want to get labs done, you know, prior. And so you have people that within the care team will tell you how to do that in advance and how to you know, get a script if you need. And also importantly, technology, which we know when it works, it works great. When it doesn't work, it's not so great. So make sure that you have you know, good Wi-Fi, well-lit location, et cetera. And just make sure you certainly can plan for your visit. And if you need to show a body part or wear accessible clothing, that's very important. And uh, collect recent vital signs, which would be help and uh, blood pressure cuff. And also I think is really important that's not here is you know an O2 saturation monitor. Oftentimes a physician will ask if a patient has that and you can buy those, you know, any like CVS or Walgreens pharmacy, you know, and at the end of your visit, you know, just check for future appointments, whether it's going to be virtual or in a person. And just remember while you're talking to the doctor, if you need a refill, ask them then. It's just much easier for them to process that for you. So these are just some suggestions for, you know, your telemedicine visit, which um, can be very important and maybe just save you that time from going into the office if you can't make it due to transportation issues or if you're not feeling well. Next slide. So infection prevention and treatment, which is always very, very important. So, you know, with patients with multiple myeloma, we have, you know, compromised immune systems. And so patients are extremely susceptible to infection. So it's very important for patients to, you know, 
good um, infection precautions. I mean, always washing your hands, wearing a mask, standing more than six feet apart. I hope everybody out there, as Dr. Um, and Mikhail mentioned, that they're getting their booster shot. You know, and if you're sick, just stay home. Um, you know, good supportive care for patients. If their white count is low due to treatment, that we can give them growth factor to build up that white count to hopefully prevent patients um, from getting infections. All patients should be up to date on their um, immunizations, which is extremely important too. And also supportive medications, you know, some antibacterials or antiviral therapies that we prescribe to patients when they're on certain medications, the antibacterials when patients are on, so that'd be the backdrop. So when patients, they're on a prophylactically when they're receiving high doses of steroids, antivirals, we can see reactivations of herpes zoster with some of the proteasome inhibitors for patients. Our, our patients also, because their immune system is compromised, are susceptible to secondary um, activations of some infection. So it's very important. Some new research has looked at for patients receiving active myeloma therapy because they're so susceptible in the beginning of an infection is to put them on levofloxacin once daily for 12 weeks to reduce the infection, fevers, or even death. It's very important. Again, I just, you know, good, hand, clean hand washing, report fever of more than 100.4 or shaking, kill, skin, shaking chills, even without a fever, any dizziness, shortness, of breath, um, low blood pressure to your healthcare provider immediately because infection is a serious, is very serious for patients with multiple myeloma because they don't have the immune system to fight infections. Those plasma cells are not working properly. A simple cold or a, a cold to a myeloma patient can progress to an upper respiratory infection to pneumonia. So we have to be very, very careful. So, you know, we don't see as much we didn't see much flu last year because people were, you know, being very cautious. So we need to continue that at all times. Next slide. So myeloma treatments both contribute to how to really to how you feel. So we know that um, as Dr. McHale went over that crab, crab criteria, myeloma cells in excess can cause symptoms. You can have calcium elevation, and that's due to bone breakdown. Our bones are, are have lots of calcium in them. And so once there's bone damage, that calcium is released into the blood system and can cause you know conf confusion for patients and fatigue. Um, we need to see about we have renal dysfunction. So with myeloma cells, especially those light chains. So we have to be very careful of our kidneys. And we always tell our myeloma patients they need to be flushing their kidneys and flushing out those light chains to be drinking lots and lots of fluid all the time. You know, unfortunately, you know, some of the myeloma cells crowding out the marrow causes anemia for our patients in fatigue. Um, so how do we feel about when patients feel that way? We, we want to give patients treatment. So treatments for the myeloma kill the myeloma cells, but they also cause symptoms. So they can cause myelosuppression. So that can be a decrease in your white cells, your red cells, or your platelets. Peripheral neuropathy can be a side effect of the drugs that we see, some of the proteasome inhibitors with the Velcade therapy. Um, when, when patients were getting that IV, but now when it's given um, subcutaneously, those peripheral neuropathies can be less, but you can have peripheral neuropathies you know, due to you know, compression fractures in your spine that are leaning on nerves. So again, just always making sure you're letting your care team know about any symptoms that you're having. Um, some of these uh, treatments can cause diarrhea or fatigue. We know that um, you know, we're very well versed in one of the side effects of therapy that you receive. And some drugs can cause an increased risk of deep vein thrombosis. So patients who are on immunomodulatory drugs and high doses of steroids, we make sure patients are on anticoagulation. We talked about the increased risk of infection with patients and we prophylax for that. And patients can have a multiple of other symptoms from, but it's very important to communicate with your care team who was we're here to improve how you feel so you have a good quality of life, but still manage your myeloma disease. Next slide, please. 
So what happens if the symptoms are not managed effectively? Well, we, you know, we, we don't have a crystal ball and we really want to hear from the patient. So it's very, very important to discuss um, any side effects that you're feeling with a you know, physician because we want to improve your quality of life. Because if you have poorly managed symptoms, it can lead to anxiety and depression, which leads to social isolation, that you don't want to take your drugs, you know, then your treatment efficacy is reduced. You have you don't have a very good quality of life. So it's really important. You know, we can manage your symptoms through, you know, dose modification. And I always tell my patients that there's nothing wrong with dose modification. We just want to make sure that we target the right dose in drug to the patient. So we need to hear and don't, so I don't want patients to think that, oh, I don't want to complain. I don't want to, you know, I don't want them to dose reduce my drug because then it won't be effective. That's not how it works. So we need to know how you're feeling. Again, looking at the whole picture, we want, you know, we know that you have myeloma, but we want to be able to, to see that you have a good quality of life while you're receiving treatment. So the doctor does want to hear from you. The team wants to know how you're doing. So keep a symptom of your you know, diary to, to discuss with the teams. As I said, many options, um, but your care team, we can't, we don't know it unless you tell us. And so through appropriate dose modification or interruption in treatment, for a while to get you back to feeling better is we, we can do that so to keep you on track with therapy so express your priorities you know fatigue is a common concern but making the right decision is a higher priority for most and we want to make sure that you have a good quality of life while you're being treated next slide please so we always talk about the steroids, the dreaded steroids, the side effects in management. Um, we've talked about it a lot today. We know that there are multiple side effects to steroids. They can cause irritability, mood swings, depression, difficulty sleeping, um, you know, blurred vision, cataracts, stomach bloating, weight gain, hair loss. And so we un certainly understand that and we can manage that. I mean, steroids do play a very important role in the treatment for myeloma. They help kill the myeloma cells, so you can't stop them or adjust them unless you discuss it with your healthcare provider. But managing some of these side effects can help, you know, the consistent schedule, the, the morning dosing versus the PM dosing. I, you know, I used to tell a lot of my patients to take it at bedtime and they would think that, you know, like, why would they say that? It already keeps me up all night. But by the if you take it at bedtime and by the time those side effects kick in, you know, six, seven hours later, you've already gotten yourself a good night's sleep. So some patients say it works great and they will only take their steroids at bedtime and others say it doesn't work. So it's individual um, you know, choice for patients to um, take your steroids with food. Um, we make sure that you take an over-the-counter prescription drug with that, like something to protect your stomach. And also because you can be at risk for infections or thrush with, um, with high doses of steroids. So making sure you're seeing your, your dentist too. Um, so we give you medications to prevent you know, the shingles or the thrush or other, um, other types of infections that can happen. Uh, next cycle, uh, next slide, please. I'm thinking of cycles. So fatigue, depression, and anxiety, they can all affect your quality of life and your relationships. You don't want to be fighting with your family. Um, sources include, you know, the anemia or pain. Patients can have, you know, myeloma patients, you know, have can have lots of, uh, you know, bone pain. Um, so that reduces activity and patients don't want to go out and participate in anything and then they can't sleep or treatment toxicity. So management is, is you know, you just can't sit there and lay there. You need to, again, you need to get up and out and exercise or just walk, just go some, from some daily walks, try to get as much rest appropriately, you know, take naps during the day if you can. And again, a lot of this can, you know, you need social support. Um, we, you know, we can, you can be referred to, you know, social workers or psychiatry for any issues with anxiety or depression. Um, some patients can benefit from spiritual support or meditation or mindfulness-based stress reduction. There are medications out there. So it's very important um, to communicate. In transfusions, a lot of times patients will, you know, 
you know, maybe if they're feeling, you know, they're anemic, um, their red cells are low, and maybe just a simple, you know, transfusion will, you know, really makes a world of difference and makes patients feel very well. And it's just important to note, at least 70% of patients do experience fatigue. So you're not out there, you're not alone, thinking that this, you know, this only affects me, but you know, only 20% tell their providers. So you need to let the provider know about the symptoms that are well, they're not well controlled, or any thoughts or if you felt like harming yourself, but just really good communication because we can, you know, we certainly refer to the multidisciplinary team. We can make, you know, modifications in any of your dosing that may be leading to you feeling, you know, just fatigued and uh, lack of energy, et cetera, especially with the steroids too. Next slide. Peripheral neuropathy management. So we know that some drugs can cause peripheral neuropathies. We, for years, we were dealing with um, patients who had uh, severe issues with Velcade therapy, but now um, as an IV, but now as a subcutaneous, we see less. And then we have the oral um, peripheral neuropathy, I mean, excuse me, the oral proteasome inhibitor and then Laro. And, and with each drug, it's the peripheral neuropathy issue is less and less. Um, this is damage to the nerves in the extremities, um, in the hands, the feet, or the limbs. And it presents itself with numbness or tingling or that prickling sensation on sensitivity to touch, burning, or cold. So certainly, you know, we, when we see the patients, when we, especially when they're on proteasome inhibitors, we do are always questioning questioning those patients or have them. When I was doing clinical studies with these uh, drugs, would have patients fill out peripheral neuropathy questionnaires and we would look at them from cycle to cycle to see if, if the peripheral neuropathy in these patients was getting worse or not. So we do want to try to prevent um, any type of nerve damage. So we can do that through, you know, changing a patient's schedule, how they're getting their therapy or through dose of certainly dose modification, you know, um, going from bortezomib of once weekly to subcutaneous, um, massaging with uh, cocoa butter regularly, it has those antioxidants. And, you know, supplements can help um, the vitamin B complex, B1, B6, or B12. You know, um, oftentimes as we get older, something, you know, we can have a depletion in vitamin B12 in our system, which can cause tingling. So oftentimes we'll draw, you know, vitamin B12 tighter to see what the level is for those patients. Also um, supplements of folic acid or amino acids, but don't take those on the day of Velcade infusion. And, you know, if, you know, we worry about the peripheral neuropathies, you know, causing numbness where patients can't be lifting their feet. So, you know, environmentally should really remove any um, area rugs or furnishings or anything that can be in the way that some, you could trip. If the peripheral neuropathy worsens, again, we can change your treatment, prescribe oral topical pain medications, suggest, you know, physical therapy and making, you know, certainly very important adjustments in your, your medication. Next slide, please. So pain and uh, prevention and management pain obviously can uh, significantly compromise patients quality of life with, you know, uh, bone disease, neuropathy and other medical procedures. So you know, how do we manage this and try to prevent pain uh, when possible? Obviously, we give most of our patients, most of our patients get bone strengtheners. So hopefully to prevent any future skeletal events. Um, very importantly. Um, also, there's an intervention that depends on the source of pain. So if patients, you know, generally we see a majority of bone pain in their patient's spine, causing vertebral compression fractures in those, those fractures or when the collapse of the vertebral body on nerves can cause terrible pain for patients. Um, we can intervene with, you know, either vertebroplasty or kyphoplasty, or if patients have, you know, any type of hip pain, or, you know, refer them to orthopedics. So it's very important to have some type of intervention. Um, obviously, medications may help, uh, or radiation therapy, kind of spot welding an area to relieve a patient's pain. Um, physical therapy is something that's very important we can send patients to, you know, complementary or alternative medications, you know, acupuncture, some patients find that they have can have pain relief or some supplements. So very important, you know, tell your healthcare provider about new pain or chronic pain that's not adequately controlled. Just don't live with the pain, you know, just thinking, well, this is what I, this is how it's going to be. That's not how it's going to be. And, you know, we're here to work with um, the patients to, to, so they can benefit from a good quality of life. Next 
slide, please. So, you know, you're not alone, you know, knowledge is power and, you know, the IMF is, has wonderful resources and to help a patients through their journey with their myeloma treatment. So I would highly recommend that, you know, look, download or, you know, order copies of at myeloma.org, you know, any, they have all kinds of educational information on all the latest, you know, therapies that are out there. Um, again, you know, downloading information about, you know, patients you know, important patient questions to ask their physician. So I highly recommend that, you know, all patients go into myeloma, also, myeloma.org also gives you inf all kinds of information about your disease. What is my, what is multiple myeloma? What are all the terms that we're using all the time? So it really has a wealth of information. So I want to, I hope I didn't go over my time and I just want to say thank you very much. And we're here for questions. So thank you. Bravo, bravo. That was, a, yeah. you got through a lot there. I think that uh, your last thing about the IMF, I want to, all our publications, I just want to tell you, you can go to myeloma.org and get whatever you need. And you can get papers that the Nurse Leadership Board has uh, presented, which are many, many, many. Oh, yeah. And, and, and I, how many is it now? Is it 25 or something? What? No, no. Your, your papers and such. It's got to be. Oh, right yes, now. yes, yes, yes. Yeah, it's, it's awesome. It's just awesome. Uh, we have a few minutes, Joe. Do you want to try to take two questions? Sure. I think we could do a couple quickly while Kathy just catches her breath. I'll answer. There are two questions that came to us <laughs> about maintenance therapies. Um, you know, is there a standard approach? Should be should it be tailored and someone else? A few questions about it. Short version is that we have learned that after transplant, if we can give people some kind of treatment, typically with Revlimid or lenalidomide, it can keep people's remission lasting longer and actually extend their life. We have overall survival benefit. But there's a lot of ifs about that. Some people can't tolerate the Revlimid. Some people may already have resistant disease to Revlimid. So we do have to individualize it. I think there are more and more studies now looking at how we can add more to Revlimid, whether it's Carfilzomib, Daratumumab, Ixazomib, they're different choices. So that kind of has to be discussed individually. I think maybe the last question we'll give to Kathy, uh, uh, Kelly, because it's very relevant to part of her discussion was, can the Shingrix vaccine replace valcyclovir or maybe even acyclovir, um, you know, as we use it for shingles prophylaxis, as you discussed? All right. Well, that was very interesting because I will tell you, our, so our patients do get the Shingrix, but we still keep them on antiviral therapy. Sure. Yeah, I agree. I, I don't think we have enough evidence to stop doing that. I mean, right. I do like seeing people get a non-live vaccine like that one because I think there is benefit to it. Yeah, but I agree. I think it's too risky uh, to not continue that while they're on drugs like Fortnite. Exactly. Right. Back to you, Kelly. Okay, great. And just a couple of quick things. You know, the IMS has been doing this for 31 years. If you were to draw a circle and put the letter P equaling patients, you would see that we funnel everything that we do for the patients, period. That's what we do. It's, we don't sell chickens or do meat or whatever the heck everyone does. We work on myeloma Oma. only. So you got to realize that you've got a friend that's here to help you. And that's the IMF. And it's at myeloma.org. And then we have an info line at 800-452-CURE. So give that a shot. Please call, 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 call. I like to keep those guys in the info line busy and i want to say i heard cure a lot today take a breath and think about that that's not something we heard 20 years ago and finally thank you to our panel dr joe you were fantastic and you'll tell dr freeman that she was we'll send a nice thank you letter and she is she's from texas right i know she's originally from ireland yeah, i did not good nice nice <laughs> And Kathy, as usual, thank you for taking Saturday Welcome. afternoon with us and doing this. Your talk was fantastic. So folks out there, this is going to be up for an immediate recording uh, shortly after this, this, uh, this, this talk today. And remember, myeloma.org and our sponsors, Amgen, Bristol Myers Squibb, GSK, Janssen, Cario Farm, Oncopeptides, and Takeda Oncology. Thanks, everyone. Have a great weekend. Bye. You too. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thanks, Kathy. Uh, thank you so much. Great job, Joe, as always. I love yeah. it. So Bye. Good. Thank you. Bye, Kelly. Someone who's just been diagnosed with myeloma has a million questions. Patients will call 
with questions about the particular drug that they've been put on or a side effect that they're experiencing. We get calls from patients who are living with the disease 25 years out, 15 years out, 10 years out, 32 years out. When you hear from patients who are living a long life and a decent quality of life with myeloma, it's hugely rewarding. You know things are working. You know they're getting good treatment from their doctors. The meds they're on are working. The advances that have been made in the care and the treatment and the understanding of the disease. In recent years, the advances have been so tremendous that it's now so much more like managing a chronic disease. And it's wonderful if we can help connect people to different solutions and find ways to make things easier. It's really important to get good information, get current information. We have contacts all over the world, Europe, Middle East, India, Asia, Australia, and Latin America. We're here to help, to answer your questions, to get you connected to a support group and other patients, to get you a referral to some of the top myeloma specialists in the world. Or we're here to just lend an ear. So give us a call.